returned to the last day of hearings on the Waco investigation. Two weeks ago, a House Joint Subcommittee began 10 days of hearings into events at Waco, Texas in the spring of 93. The primary witness Tuesday was Attorney General Janet Reno. The uh, joint hearing will reconvene when we recessed for lunch a few minutes ago. Uh, it was the time to recognize Mr. Condit for questioning, and you are recognized for five minutes, Mr. Condit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Attorney General. Thank you very much for being here, and you've certainly been uh, most kind and uh, cooperative with your time, and we appreciate that very much. Attorney General Reno, uh, when we started these hearings, uh, some people had the perception that the ATF is an agency out of control. I think these hearings have shown that this is not necessarily the case, but it has opened up questions about the workings of federal law enforcement agencies in general. It appears that the lack of coordination between uh, the agencies involved was in many ways uh, detrimental to the success of, uh, of this undertaking. While we've heard testimony from the uh, ATF and the FBI, there are scores of other federal agencies with their own law enforcement arms, such as the National Institute of Standards and the Standards and Technology and the Government Printing Office. In fact, the Congressional Research Service found that there are over 140 different federal law enforcement agencies responsible for enforcing 4,100 federal criminal laws. And what I really want to get to, and I want to take a little different twist than, than what we've been talking about. Mr. Klinger sort of talked about it a little bit, but I'd like to get a little, a little more definite, defined answer than, than we put meetings together. What I really want to know is, do we really need all these different agencies? Are there ways we can consolidate the responsibilities of some of these different agencies? And didn't the Vice, President plan, uh, Vice President's plan to reinvent government contain a proposal that would appoint the Attorney General as Director of Law Enforcement in order to coordinate and consolidate all these different agencies. My question again is, has, has this uh, proposal been implemented? If not, why? As I understand, is, is this on now, Mr. Chairman? You I, have to flip that switch. As I understand it, the Vice President had that under consideration as part of the National Performance Review. He talked about, uh, he explored the possibility of, of merging some of the agencies. One of the areas that was discussed was the merger of the FBI and the DEA. I went into that in great detail. I listened to agents from both sides. I listened to people who had been involved in both sides. And I determined that, for example, with the Drug Enforcement Administration, its mission in terms of drug enforcement was so singular and so important that it was critical that it be retained as a separate agency. But as I indicated, I formed the Office of Investigative Agency Policy to make sure that within justice we had a coordination. To that end, and I take it a step at a time because it's important, we're trying to develop a coordinated intelligence system. before. I came to Washington, the DEA and the FBI didn't share information and intelligence information as much as they should. They now have worked out a system whereby through computers they can and do, and I think it's very effective. We're trying to coordinate and share automation, training where it is appropriate. We've, for example, formed, we've taken the INS, the United States Marshal Service, the FBI, and the Bureau of Prisons and have developed a coordinated air system for the transport of prisoners that avoids the duplication. In that regard, we have reached out to the Treasury Department. DEA and Customs have developed some very effective memorandums of understanding as to how best to proceed in a coordinated investigation involving drugs. I think we're making progress, but my understanding is that the National Performance Review is, is looking at that progress and, and measuring what we've done. With respect to this specific can I, instance, can I just ask? Can, can I just uh, ask so that I get it on the record? Uh, out of the 140 different federal law enforcement agencies responding for enforcing 4,100 criminal laws, have we eliminated any of those since the report? I'm, I'm not aware. We certainly have not in terms of any that I have jurisdiction over, but those are the major law enforcement agencies. I'm not aware 
of what has been done in the remainder of the federal government. But with respect to the specific issue that is before us today, one of the recommendations that came from the review of Waco was that the FBI should be the lead federal agency in complex hostage barricade situations and domestic terrorist operations, and I think we've made progress there. We're pursuing MOUs with law enforcement counterparts uh, to establish responsibility for control and command when tactical resources from the critical incident response group is, uh, are involved, and I think we have made real progress there. Mr. Chairman, I know my time is out, but I, I would like to um, just be on the record as, as asking and, and recommending to the committee that I serve on, which is the Government Reform Committee and Mr. Zelf's committee, if we wanted to be, I think, most helpful and, and proactive in terms of finding some sort of response to all this hearing stuff is for us to initiate some additional oversight and hearings of this 140 agencies. I mean, you're talking about the printing office, the government printing office has over 100 officers. We've got duplication throughout the system. And I just think out of all this, this may be one of the constructive things that we can do is do some oversight and see whether or not we really can help the Attorney General and the administration in, in doing away with duplication. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Mr. Condit. Uh, your time has expired. Mr. Bryant, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Attorney General, thank you for testifying today. Uh, you are a most articulate and, and loyal person to the administration, and I appreciate very much uh, the perspective you bring to these hearings. Uh, I have several, three areas of questioning I would like to ask you about. I'll do that as quickly as I can, and I would ask if you could keep your answers as, as short as possible so that I might complete those. Number one, uh, Special Agent Jamar, who was in charge of the the site at Waco has testified earlier this week, he's testified three times, but earlier that uh, had he known that the Davidians were spreading gasoline and other accelerants on the morning of the 19th, had he known this information, he would not have instituted this, uh, this action, this uh, raid or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my question to you, would you agree that had you known they were spreading gasoline or other accelerants prior to the, uh, this raid on that day, would you have also uh, not allowed this uh, action to proceed? That's correct. Now, the reason, as I understand, he did not know was because uh, they had, actually, they had ear, 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 eavesdropping uh, devices in there. And uh, I think the U.S. Attorney, the, act, uh, the uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney, Mr. John, testified in here, as he did uh, prove at trial, that the tapes that were coming out of these eavesdropping, these bugs, these tapes, which were not enhanced at that time, because Mr. John said he heard these, that he actually could discern that they were talking about spread this here or put this there, put this gasoline here or whatever. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you didn't get a complete picture uh, before you had to make your decision, that is that, in fact, the FBI knew that uh, the Davidians were spreading gasoline because they had the bug in there. Mr. John testified to that uh, or at, at these hearings. He introduced proof of that at the trial in Texas. Uh, the jury heard these tapes that were unenhanced, and you could very clearly understand what they were doing. Uh, I'm wondering why you didn't have this information uh, from the FBI, and in fact, I questioned them about this. Uh, under such a critical, at such a, uh, a, I call it the crunch time of the 51 days, this is the time when you need that inside intelligence. And it would be very critical, as you point out, because it would have caused you to, to cancel the plans had you known and, and apparently the FBI did know or should have known. Well, as Mr. Jamar said, he did not know, and the reason that he did not know was because the agents didn't pick it up because of the background noise. It's clearly in a situation like this, uh, as you probably in your experience have heard tapes that are somewhat garbled, when you're right at a scene or in a situation, and with retrospect, as you sit in the quiet, you can hear them. What I understand the Bureau has done to avoid such situations in the future, and I'm going to continue to work with Director Free to make sure that we've enhanced our efforts as much as possible, is to have a check and double check on such electronic surveillances in such critical situations. I, I agree, and, and I think, again, it just points out the need that, that they should have had trained people on the job in an environment that day that, where it was quiet and they could actually hear this information because this was critical information at a most critical time. And let me, let me move on quickly. Uh, you indicated that you had talked to the President, and I wrote this quote down as much as possible, that he, did, he acted appropriately, and he asked good questions to make sure that we had explored every opportunity. 
What specifically, what good questions did the president ask you uh, before this raid was instituted? When I called him on April the 18th, I gave him a brief overview, told him of the process very much of what I've talked with you about today. He asked further questions about the children. He asked further questions about why now uh, and satisfied himself according to what he told me that, that we had fully explored all our possible avenues. He asked what specific questions about children? I don't recall the specific questions. Uh, I just remember that he was specifically concerned about the children and that wanted to make sure that I had explored uh, the possible harm to them as I considered the whole undertaking. What did you tell the president as to why now, why April 19, 1993? I don't want to take up your, the time of your question, but it goes through the whole process that I laid out to Congressman Schumer earlier. Uh, the fact that... My time is up, so you okay. can talk as long <laughs> as you want to. Okay. But again, I, before I even considered undertaking it, I wanted to make sure that the gas would not produce permanent harm to the children or to the elderly people the concerns about the HRT team, the fact that negotiations had reached a standstill according to, to Byron Sage in terms of anybody coming out voluntarily, the fact that they had a food and water supply that could last for a long time, the concerns about the perimeter. I talked about the concerns about what they might do to themselves, but mentioned that, again, the assessment was based on Koresh's own statements that the likelihood of suicide was low, that this was our best opportunity to effectively control the situation for some time to come. And he did not disapprove of your action? No, he said, it sounds like you, it, you've explored everything and I will support your decision. Thank you, Thank Mr. Bryant. Your time up. is up. Mr. Brewster, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the fact that uh, you started in the middle of this deal. You weren't sworn in until, I believe, March 12th. Uh, this started quite some time before that. I can't imagine the pressure of trying to get settled in a new office at the same time something like this was going on. Uh, my question to start with would be, were you aware of uh, the extreme uh, conflicts, uh, as far as we can tell, between the negotiators and the tactical team? And were you also aware of the tactical team's intent to use the psychological pressure of uh, Tibetan Buddhist chants, uh, a myriad of animal sounds, including uh, uh, the slaughtering of rabbits. Uh, was that something that was ever brought up to you? And also the conflict part? With respect to the conflict, that was brought up to me in memorandum, w which I started to consider at about the time that I started to consider the, the whole plan mm -hmm. for the gas. Uh, it was clear as, as a result of it. That's one of the reasons that we went back to Byron Sage, that I asked Webb Hubble to call Byron Sage to make sure that at least at that point when I knew of these situations that we had done everything we could to negotiate the situation and that's produced what I understand was a two-hour call between the two in which Mr. Sage said that based on everything he knew at that point we had reached an impasse in trying to get people to come out voluntarily. Again, our whole effort was to continue to negotiate but he felt that the additional step was going to be necessary. With respect to the noise and, and the like, I was advised of that at the time. I was advised again that it was part of, I didn't know whether, I didn't know at the time that there were conflicts between the tactical people and the negotiators. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I think the recommendation that there be a team of negotiators and operators in the critical incident response group is, is one of the most important developments that we've undertaken. You know, I think these hearings, if nothing else, have debunked any conspiracy theory that may be out there for those who have watched it all the way through. Uh, for me, at least, it also pointed out mistakes that I think were made in the way the plan was executed from the beginning on. Uh, I would certainly hope that those, uh, there have been changes made in, in theory on how we would attack uh, a problem such as this again. I think also anyone that's watched this has to believe that David Koresh had certainly committed some crime, was certainly a bad guy. Uh, but the mistakes that were made in executing the warrant to start with and everything else have been uh, very troubling to me. Have changes been made, in your opinion? I know Mr. McGaw told us of numerous changes made at ATF. Have changes also been made at FBI concerning the way these would be handled in the future? As, as I have indicated previously, I can't 
speak to the issues involved in the initial raid, but only with respect to what the FBI is responsible for. And as I outlined uh, at the beginning, one of the first steps was to create the Critical Incident Response Group. It's based at Quantico with an HRT team enhanced in, in number and enhanced in its ability to work with um, the negotiators. We now have a larger number of negotiators at Quantico who work daily with the operators so that they form a partnership, a team, an understanding, okay. an alliance up front. When we, you have an opportunity, send us something on that if you could. I, One last question. To you and I, it may seem that some of these far out religious beliefs out there are certainly far out. It does to me. I don't know how anyone could follow uh, some of the things that Koresh did. But on the other hand, they're out there. Do you think it would be beneficial to, to ATF or FBI in the future when there's some very radical religious group out there uh, to utilize more people such as professors who may have some understanding of that and have some better understanding of who's suicidal, who's not? I think that the FBI consulted with some, in, uh, some experts that had a, a good feel for it that talk about suicide and based uh, again on Koresh's own statements it's it's hard to predict but regardless one of the things that we have done and I understand from Director Free he is you don't want to find out about religious groups I mean, you don't want to investigate religious groups you don't want the FBI doing something in in lawful groups right. and so it's important that that we have a roster of outside experts that we can talk to about different types of religion and my understanding is that the Bureau has developed that list that they can consult with as appropriate and needed. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr. Brewster. Your time has expired. Mr. Heineman, I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Let me add my welcome Attorney General Reno. On making the decision to go on April 19th you spoke to Mr. Jamar, Mr. Potts, Mr. Clark, and Director Sessions, and you were all in concert on that, that it was okay to go? I don't have a specific record because, again, I was new uh, in office, and I don't have, I, there were so many names. I have a specific recollection of talking directly with Director Sessions, Floyd Clark, uh, Larry Potts. I believe Doug Gow was part of that group, but this the specific people that I talked to most of the time uh, were Larry Potts and Floyd Clark. There was a consultant from Syracuse. In 25 words or less, if you can, can you tell me what his contribution was? My understanding is that the Bureau had used him extensively over the last 18 years in negotiation situations. When they received the letter of April the 14th that Koresh sent out to Daguerrean, they sent it immediately to him. He assessed that letter and reviewed that letter and presented a report. Just that he thought that, that it was a dodge? That it was a dodge, but he went in, he, he analyzed the religious implications of it. We'll provide you with a copy of the letter so that I don't misstate it in any way. Did he render an opinion as to whether you should go or you, or you shouldn't go as far as assaulting the compound? To my knowledge, he did not, but I would have to refer you to the FBI in case they consulted him. I was not advised of it. Had you at any time spoken to Mr. Shemerick? He was a member of the FBI. No, I did not. Did they ever show you reports by Mr. Shemerick? He submitted four reports relative to, at various times, as to whether they should wait or go in. At the point that I was be beginning to make the decision whether I saw the reports or was told of the reports, I cannot tell you, sir. But I, one way or the other, I was advised of some of the concerns expressed in the reports, the tension between negotiators and others. I remember particularly Dr. Park Dietz's uh, memorandum expressing some of the concerns, and that's one of the reasons we were, felt it was important to having been advised of this, see whether there was anything that could be done at that point in terms of negotiation. If you can remember, the most valuable piece of information you received when you had reluctance about going in, your gut feel initially was that we'll put a hold on it. And then you changed your position on that. 
What specifically made you change your position? You had a, a signed document that apparently you scanned cursory. Um, and I'd just like to know what changed your mind to say, OK, we'll go. I'd like to address the issue of what you refer to as the signed document. There's an awful lot of confusion that's been developed. This is a briefing book that was presented to me on April the 12th. Uh, it's a briefing for the Attorney General. This is what I read as I started to consider uh, whether to even consider the, the gas plan. I went through it in detail, and that's, it's this book and some of the descriptions of what gas could do that precipitated my questions. So this is a book that I read. As the week went on, there were various pieces of information being collected, and I wanted to make sure that we had on paper what we had done. A summary was prepared. I read that summary and asked them to provide the backup to the summary. I can't tell, it was not a gut feeling early on, and it was not go, no go. It was, I don't have the, I can't say at this point that we should go. All of the factors were important. The fact that the perimeter was unstable, the fact that negotiations had reached an impasse according to SAGE, the fact that the food and water supply could last up to a year, the fact that he had rehearsed a suicide plan and could, based on what the experts were telling us, based on his, some of the religious statements, could possibly commit suicide. He talked about Lake Waco causing a catastrophe of some sort. Based on all of this, as we discussed it and as the FBI talked about the state of readiness of the HRT team and the fact that they did not have a backup capable of substituting with adequate security in place of the HRT team, I made the decision to go ahead. I would say probably the feature was, again, the HRT team not having the state of readiness, but that by itself would not be adequate. Thank you. Time has expired. Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much. And to uh, Attorney General Reno, let me thank you for your leadership in actions involving violence against women, and particularly the establishment of the advisory committee dealing with clinic violence. I thank you for that. I will have to go with a great deal of rapid speed, and so I apologize for my uh, talking at a very rapid pace. I know Chairman Zellow started out this morning, and I believe if I can paraphrase him with a comment that uh, military weapons were turned against uh, the American people. Uh, we find that we are abounded with, if you will, conspiratorial theories. Coming from Texas, we were riveted by this experience, all of us, to a one, realized that these were Texans, human beings, the ATF officers were our neighbors, uh, and there was a great deal of emotion and concern. But I think if we do anything for the American people during this process, it should be an emphasis that the government works. We have referred uh, constantly to a document called WACMUR, W-A-C-M-U-R, Major Case Number 80, Assault on a Federal Officer Briefing for the Attorney General dated April 12, 1993. Mr. Chairman, I'd like unanimous consent to admit the entire document to the record Without at objection. this time. Ms. Uh, Reno, I'm going to quickly uh, try to bring to your attention just some snippets, if you will, out of this document, and I must move quickly. One, starting with strategy, FBI deadly force policy. Um, against any person except as necessary. Agents are not to use deadly force against any person except as necessary in self-defense or the defense of another when they have a reason to believe that they, are, they or another are in danger of death or grievous bodily harm. All personnel being deployed were advised of these rules. So my understanding is that there was in your document the acknowledgement of the policy of not to use deadly force. And I think we can admit that no FBI agent uh, used any weapon during this period of time. We then had a series of uh, episodes uh, relayed to you so that we can know what was going on. On the uh, 2nd of March, played an hour-long tape recorded message by Koresh over national radio and television. I think they were trying to accommodate his concerns. Davidians are given a new telephone and a 150-foot cord per their demand, 3493. A suture kit is sent in for Koresh's injured wrist. 
Davidians are offered removal of the Bradleys in exchange for the release of sect members 3793, allow Davidians to bury Peter Gent's body. Uh, 3993, three released children are reunited with a parent, William Mob. Uh, we have uh, put physicians on telephone to assist Judy Snyder and others. That was on 31293. Returned phone calls to a compound by numerous children, in addition to Kathy Schroeder, Brad Branch, etc., and Sheila Martin. These are things that were occurring to be of assistance to move this along. And then we had um, a document where you were able to read about the medical personnel that would be there. A minimum required staffing is 12 dedicated medical care providers, ambulances, etc. that would be there. There was discussion about the CS gas, and I think we will always raise the concern of whether or not that should have been utilized, but you had language in here that gave you uh, at least an expression that extensive testing had been done regarding children. You asked the question about, there was a comment about pregnant women and children that had been mentioned. That's in this document. And then lastly, um, there is a letter from David Koresh, uh, which uh, includes in there a comment that says, I am your God, and you will bow under my feet. These documents or these uh, comments were in this particular document. You have just testified that you read it extensively. Two questions that I have then. With this document in hand, did you try to expose yourself in the FBI, no matter what problems we may have now seen and we want to correct, with as much information as you possibly could, including during the negotiation process, the fact that the FBI appeared to be trying to accommodate all that the Branch Davidians were asking for. For we have all seen what can happen when one's constitutional rights are undermined. Would you answer that question for me, please, and follow it up by my final question, a direct response to this question. Did the President of the United States use the telephone system, the fax system, the memorandum system, any communication system, internet, to call you up and say, go get them, General Reno. Now is the time to do it. It is time for us to go forth on the siege. These are my orders. Do it now and I will get a report from you later. Would you answer those two questions, please? Thank you very much. First, with respect to, to the report, after I looked at the report on April the 12th, I still had questions. That's when I really started, I mean, I read this report, then I said, I still wanted more information about the children. That's when they arranged for a meeting on April the 14th with Dr. Harry Salem and myself so I could inquire further. Then I wanted to know about the water supply, and they pursued that further. We were concerned because it was in this time frame that we were beginning to, to hear that there might be some tension between the tactical people and the negotiating people. And we wanted to make sure that at least at that point, we had done everything we could to pursue negotiation strategies that might affect a peaceful resolution. So it's at that time that I found out more about the HRT team, the fact that we only had one, that we couldn't pull back and put in a substitute. So these were some of the issues that I considered in addition to this briefing material that I received. This was not the final document. This was not the final upon. document. This was the beginning. Um, with respect to, to your second question, no, the President of the United States never told me to do that. It would be wrong and improper for him to do it. He did everything, as I have said, what I consider to be the right way, which is to let law enforcement do its job and advise the President in critical circumstances. We had no direct orders from the President? No. I mean, the President of the United States told me, look, it sounds to me like you all have explored everything, and I'll stand behind you. Ms. Jackson Lee, your time has expired. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sh Mr. Shattig, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Reno, um, I, I am pleased to have you here and appreciate the opportunity to ask you some questions which I believe need to be asked. You are clearly uh, an articulate spokesman on this issue. Um, I must tell you, in a world where uh, too many of us all too often seek to duck individual responsibility, it is truly impressive that you have stepped up to take responsibility for something which I think may at least to some degree not be your responsibility to a degree greater than you believe. Um, the siege began by another agency. You had been in office only 38 days. Ultimately, when it fell apart, you took the fall. You took the blame. You said it was my decision. But decisions are only as good as the information you are provided. And someone said here this morning, other people might have helped you more by giving you, I think, more accurate information, but they did not. 
I am deeply troubled by the information you were given, and indeed by the information we've been given in this hearing. Byron Sage, the chief negotiator, came before this committee and said very uh, directly that he never gave up hope. And yet, in your report, that is the Justice Department's report at page 270, it reports that Mr. Hubble advised you that Sage, quote, that Sage said, quote, further negotiations with the subjects in the compound would be fruitless. In the FBI's interview of Mr. Hubble, it says, Hubble recalls A.G. Reno inquired, why now? Indeed, as reading this record, it is clear you agonized over this decision. You were, in fact, deeply concerned about this children. But it goes on. She was told the negotiations would not get anyone else out of the compound and that the negotiations were at an impasse. I am troubled by Mr. Sage saying he never gave up and you being told that negotiations were fruitless and you would never get anybody out, they were at an impasse. But I'm troubled more by additional testimony we got. I asked a panel that came here a question about why a building was crushed. Interestingly, that picture we have of the portion of the gym being crushed is now missing. I can't find it. I'm told either the FBI or the Department of Justice took it back. But this photograph shows the gymnasium at the back, on the right-hand side of that gymnasium. At one point, that gymnasium was destroyed. I asked a question about why it was destroyed. Mr. Clark, who was not asked the, asked the question, became quite angry with me and said the answer was clearly in the report given to you and that it was that under the plan, the ops plan for this invasion or whatever you want to call it, the operations personnel on, thor on site were given the authority to crush the building if in fact after 48 hours there was no progress. And yet that crushing began at 1130 in the morning. Um, I found it troubling, and I looked through the report. I didn't see the answer in the ops plan. But the next day, I asked Mr. Jamar. Mr. Jamar was here, and Mr. Jamar said that Mr. Clark was dead wrong, absolutely wrong on that issue, that there was no intent to crush the gym, that, in fact, the tank was trying to go through. Now, that's troubling, because both on the video and in the still pictures, you can see the tank could have gone all the way through. So I have trouble with Mr. Jamar's testimony. And that leads me to two questions I have to ask you. Three questions I have to ask you. First, um, the, the gas injection began at 6.04, 6 a.m. Precisely four minutes after that, four minutes into this plan, the shots were reported and the contingency plan was set aside and we now went to the massive injection all at once of gas. One question I have for you is, and I'm going to state the three questions and let, let you answer them. Did you in Washington at 7.04 a.m. Washington time, four minutes into this, Consider abandoning your speech and staying to moderate, considering the massive escalation. Second question I have. At 9 o'clock, you depart for your speech to go to the 4th District Circuit in Baltimore. At ex that's 9 o'clock Waco time, 10 a.m. Washington, D.C. time. At 10 a.m. also, the phone which the Davidians have is thrown out the window. Um, 40, 10 minutes later, a banner is put up by the Davidians. We want our phone fixed. Forty minutes after that, the FBI, after beginning to run out of gas, puts up a sign that responds, we will only fix your, sign, your phone if you will agree to surrender. My question of you is, were you advised when you went to Baltimore that the phone line had been broken? Were you, and would you have said, the only way we'll fix the phone is if you agree to surrender? Um, I want to know the information you were given. The third question I have is, goes back to the destruction of the gym. Um, at 9.30, the FBI begins to run out of gas. Uh, at 11.30, um, the crushing of that gym begins. I see, as I said in your own testimony and throughout this proceeding, you agonized over injury to the women and the children who were clearly innocent. Had, were you advised that the gym was to be crushed, whether Mr. Jamar is right or Mr. Clark is right, it was in fact crushed, a section 40 feet by 40 feet or 45 feet by 45 feet, and had you known that the plan was going to escalate to the degree of crushing the gym. If you, were you told that? And if you were not told that, would you have agreed to the crushing of the gym? What was uh, your first question? Uh, the first question was, first question was, four minutes into the raid, it escalates. We, we, the the 48-hour plan, according to the testimony, is gone. We're now going to do a massive insertion of gas into every window. Did you consider staying in Washington, D.C., given that escalation four minutes into the plan? At 6 o'clock in the morning, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was there. Uh, it con escalated consistent with the plan. The shots were fired. And 
the tanks began to insert gas throughout the compound. During the course of the morning, the question arose whether I should cancel the speech, and the FBI did not want me to do so because they thought it would attract attention if I suddenly canceled a speech that looked like there would be an emergency. I, uh, I think that goes to the issue of the FBI did not want you to do so. I think that's an important piece of information. Well, just let me finish. Because What's your second question? The second question was, at 10 a.m. Washington time, 9 a.m. Waco time, you depart for Baltimore. I think you got your time wrong. Okay, what, you know what time? Because I saw the phone thrown out. You did out. see the phone thrown out? And my understanding is you'd have to check with Mr. Sage uh, because I didn't hear his testimony. I'll be happy to check with it. But my understanding is they said, we'll get you your phone back if you really want to negotiate. Well, 50 minutes later, according to, to the information we have, they responded by megaphone, we will only fix the phone if it is used to surrender. Well, we can correct, I mean, we can provide you with whatever Mr. Sage said, but my understanding at the time from a distance was that if we provide you with the phone, will you negotiate? Well, well we all deal with hypotheticals in law school. I'm sure you dealt with them. Well, I'm, that's the reason I'm suggesting that we get exactly what Mr. Sage said. Would you have agreed that we would only give the phone back if they agreed to surrender? I don't know what the circumstances would be there. What I would prefer, rather than talking about hypotheticals, is what actually happened. Okay, then the third question is the, demolish, the demolition of the gym. Uh, were you aware of it? Had you been aware of it, would you have agreed to it, given the potential danger to people inside? Uh, what I understand there, and again, I have not been able to hear all of the testimony, but we can review it, is that the plan, when they started to fire on them, was to insert gas throughout the compound, and they proceeded to do that. I have heard, and I, this is just hearsay at this point because I haven't seen the exact transcript of what the uh, vehicle operator said, but that it was an in inadvertent crushing of a back support. I, why? Don't laugh at me, please, no, because no, it, it's impossible well, that's the to look reason. at the videotape of that tank going in and okay, out of that but, gym and up on its roof. But what, I'm it what I am asking you to do is to look to the record. I looked at the videotape. Okay, well, then you make your best judgment, but I'm giving you the information that I know. Just again, if you had known they were going to crush the gym, would you have approved of that? The statement, as you will recall, that was provided was that um, in the event that all persons do not leave the compound after the initial introduction of CS or that good faith negotiations leading to a resolution are not forthcoming, the irritant will be introduced in other wings of the compound. Eventually, walls would be torn down to increase the exposure of those still left inside. My understanding, and why I was there while it all took place, is they, we were concerned that they might be trying to block the escape. So there was a step taken to introduce a hole in the front of the building to make sure that people could come out, that there was a step taken to do the same in, with the back of the building. You also raised another question, which you've not put in one of your three questions, and that was, um, I believe it was you with respect to the uh, incons what you perceive to be an inconsistency between Mr. Sage and Mr. Hubble. What Mr. Sage, I understand, because I checked on this, uh, said and what Mr. Hubble advised me is that negotiations had reached an impasse at that point and he did not expect others to come out. But our whole purpose had been to continue to try not to give up because our hope was that with the injection of gas or the statement that we're going to start injecting gas, they would begin to negotiate so that there was a consistent effort to try to do everything we could with the increased pressure not to give up hope. So I don't see any inconsistency. The phone Mr. Shatting, facilitated those negotiations. Your time has expired. Um, the, as my understanding, there's no one who wants time at this time on my left, even though Mr. Taylor hasn't been recognized. And so I'm going to Mr. Blute. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much, Attorney General Reno, for your testimony. Um, I have a great deal of respect for you and, and, and the job that you are doing, and, and you and I have agreed on many issues uh, that have come before this Congress uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, I think uh, this incident was, is a great American tragedy. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, clearly, Mr. Koresh is the ultimate villain uh, in this, and, and I think everyone in this committee, indeed everyone in the country, knows that. But I also believe it's not sufficient to just blame Koresh, particularly from the perspective of congressional oversight committees. I think it's important 
that we get to the bottom of the federal government's role in this, both the ATF, the FBI, the Justice Department, and the Department of Treasury, and indeed even the White House's role in this. And I think that all of those questions are clearly uh, legitimate and, and important questions, because if anything good is going to come out of this, it's going to be that we found out what happened, why it happened, and how we can avoid anything like this uh, from happening uh, in the future. Uh, let me uh, turn to a couple of the issues that have been talked about. Uh, you stated in a, uh, in a, uh, a thing, a report in the uh, USA Today, uh, an op-ed piece that, uh, quote, we didn't misunderstand Koresh, we didn't suffer from misinformation, I wasn't misled. Uh, frankly, uh, as you look at the entire testimony that we've heard in these 10 days, there seems like there was a lot of miscommunication, uh, that there were, was some misleading happening, and that there was some misinformation with regard to Koresh's theology uh, that uh, occurred in this episode. And I wondered if you could comment on the, on the comments of Mr. Stone, uh, Dr. Stone from Harvard University, uh, someone who the Justice Department, I think you chose him to conduct an investigation uh, and, and give a report on how the Justice Department uh, acted in this episode. And he was very strong in his statement. He said, quote, I do not doubt that Janet Reno was concerned for the children. She would never have felt justified in ordering the gas attack if she had understood the risk to them. I can only conclude she was misinformed and misled. Uh, I wonder if you would react to that, given that uh, this is someone who the Justice Department asked to look into this episode. Obviously, when we go out to experts, we're expecting them to come up with their thoughts we had asked Dr. Stone to look at this whole matter from the point of view of negotiations and what might have been done otherwise in terms of strategy. He also commented on the gas. He is not a toxicologist, so taking his report, we went back to the toxicologist and tried to look at it. He has been very gracious in responding and saying, I may not be a toxicologist, but I'm a doctor and I know what can happen. We then proceeded to talk with the, the British experts, one of whom is a pathologist, is a physician, who could understand. We are trying to do everything we can to make sure that we're fully informed and based on the experts that have, we have talked to, and we will continue to try to do everything we can, this is a safe gas that would, have not, would not have produced permanent harm. He, he also but that is, as, as I said earlier this morning, we're going to continue to review all the technology, both for CS gas, and for any technology that can produce a non-lethal resolution of these matters. He also uh, indicated that the FBI had silenced its own expert. Uh, I wonder if you'd comment on that. I, I think he's referring to Mr. Smerick and the fact that Mr. Smerick has testified before this committee that he felt pressured from above in the FBI to change uh, his recommendations. I would have to re look at Mr. Smerick's testimony. That was not what I understood to be the case. Let me ask one last question about the memo uh, of March 1st uh, uh, to the President from uh, his Chief of Staff. Uh, we saw earlier in which uh, uh, clearly uh, the White House is indicating that if any significant action is taken, uh, the, uh, the White House would then approve. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier in reaction to that 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 was because we had an acting Attorney General, is that correct? That's correct. Well, at what point, in your understanding, did the White House change that? Did they issue a, uh, a memo back to you that now you were free to act on your own uh, judgment, or was this left open-ended? I don't know. I didn't, hadn't seen this memorandum, but I just knew from uh, Acting Attorney General Gerson what the President's feeling was. I didn't notify him until we had made a, a, a determination. I think I would have notified him under any circumstance. Well, let me just uh, finally say that uh, in this memo, uh, this appears to say that the White House would have the final approval of any significant action. And also in the Altman memo, uh, he refers to Secretary Benson saying that nothing like this would occur without your knowledge, meaning Secretary Benson's. And now uh, no one seems to know much about uh, that, those checkoffs of the, of the president. I don't, know any, I don't know anything about the checkoffs of Secretary Benson and our or how he was involved because they were not part of our briefing. But in terms of law enforcement initiatives, I think it is very important that law enforcement develop the plan, that the President be kept advised, and I, we tried to, to do just that. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, this guy's not here, or he is here. He is, do you wish to use your time at this point, Mr. Taylor? Are you reserving it still? I'm reserving it. All right. Then uh, I guess at this point we go to Mr. Barr for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've all heard at some length uh, about the 51 days that concern us during which the, the siege took place. Uh, what concerns me, uh, Madam Attorney General, is certainly those 51 days and the work that we've been about trying to discover what went wrong there so steps can be taken to address it. But uh, I don't know exactly how many days, 940 or whatnot, uh, uh, since then, uh, since this administration came in. And kind of looking ahead, your written statement this morning uh, has seven items listed on pages six and seven, uh, a larger hostage rescue team, increase the number of negotiators, forming a critical incident response group, uh, more SWAT teams, uh, and then two continuing studies, uh, all of which certainly are, are appropriate, I suppose, if the lessons of Waco are simply to, as you say, to improve our capacity to respond to, quote, complex hostage barricade incidents, and that's certainly appropriate. My concern is, is something a little bit broader than that, and that is looking at how this whole situation developed in the first place, uh, which even if one doesn't conclude that virtually everything about it turned out wrong, uh, certainly a number of things did. And I understand also certainly that you are the Attorney General and not the Secretary of the Treasury or the Secretary of the Interior or any other of our federal departments under which there are law enforcement components. But you are the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of this country and the Chief Advisor on Law Enforcement Matters to the President. And I was somewhat dismayed previously, and I forget which one of my colleagues on, on the, uh, the subcommittees here posed the question about sort of a broader picture in terms of solutions to this problem, looking at ATF, uh, and your response being that's a turf problem and a turf battle. And the question that I have in my mind, if, if the, the President turns to you, and I don't know whether he has or has not, but at some point I would think he would, and ask you, I mean, how can we avoid these problems in the future, not simply how can we better respond to them if they come up? Uh, I certainly would presume that you're not going to tell the president, as the chief law enforcement officer, I, I can't deal with ATF because that's a turf problem. Four agents died the very first day of this situation here, and over six dozen additional people, many of whom were innocent, uh, died in activities that were set in motion by that initial day's activities. And I think obviously some steps will have to be taken uh, that are more systemic than simply, you know, more HRT or more SWAT teams or whatnot, as important as those may be from a tactical standpoint. Uh, is, is, is this really, are these seven points on two pages, is this really all the administration has to offer the American people after 900 and some odd days and probably one of the most, if not, if not the most serious uh, law enforcement operation in the history of our country to assure the American people that not simply we're going to be better able to respond if this sort of thing does come up again, but to take meaningful steps, explicit steps, specific steps to ensure that it doesn't come up again. And I say that also in light of the fact that the administration certainly has not been timid in coming before the Congress as recently as just several weeks ago asking for additional authorities, expanded law enforcement authorities for the federal government through anti-terrorism legislation. And yet citizens have asked me, well, I mean, what's happened with the problems of Waco first before we even get to the point of does the federal government need more power? Are the problems that are apparent to all of us in Waco being properly addressed. I mean, what specific systemic steps are being taken, whether in ATF or, or, or elsewhere, in the government generally, to ensure that this doesn't happen again? One of the first steps that has been taken is the development of a critical incident response team that is not just a, a, a statement. It is a very effective team. I have had the opportunity to visit, uh, to participate in the training, to understand how the FBI would respond uh, with ATF in the future. What we're trying to do is to work out with ATF, with the customs, with any law enforcement agency involved, a capacity and an understanding where we go in first. 
But to answer your question best, one of the classic examples of how law enforcement is working, moving together, was seen as we responded, as the FBI's specially trained SACs responded to Oklahoma City. I had the opportunity to go to Oklahoma City very shortly after that tragic bombing. I walked into that command post. I found law enforcement together as I have never seen it before. ATF agents working with DEA agents and... Ma Ma Madam Attorney General, that, uh, that's very true, and that's an outstanding example of how the government can respond in a coordinated fashion to an emergency that develops. Now, you may not want to look at me. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying that I'm that's just something asked, very looking at the different. chairman to see what I'm supposed to that, do. That, that's something very Mr. different, Madam Attorney General, from what we're talking about well, here. Mr. Barr, would a you law enforcement operation planned by the government that went very badly awry, Mr. seemingly based on some systemic problems with ATF and other law enforcement agencies. That's not Oklahoma. Mr. Barr, your time has expired. The Attorney General may respond. But I'd your like time the response to, with all due respect, to be responsive. I didn't ask about Oklahoma City. Well, you may not like my response and you may disagree with it, but I am going to continue in my response because what we were faced with in Oklahoma City required close coordination of federal agencies. And we saw a very effective effort brought about in part because of the steps learned from Waco. You may disagree with that, sir, but no, I've got I, I to answer. I don't disagree with that at well, all. Well, if I may just well, finish, because I've got to answer it the best I know how. And then if you disagree, that would be, of course, your prerogative. But if I, if I could. Secondly, we have enhanced the training of SWAT teams around the country so that they are ready and far more responsive than they were before Waco. We responded to Waco and the specifics of Waco by enhanced training. We have developed a far better capacity for the negotiation team to work together with the tactical operatives. A very direct, specific step after Waco. We're going to continue to do everything that we can along these lines to develop a coordinated response of law enforcement so that we can address these issues. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Souter, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to probe a little bit and, and review some of what we've heard on the question of we did this because of the children. Um, in the process of questioning Mr. Jamar, he said it was 99% certain that they would be fired on. And I think that was a pretty good guess, given what happened with the ATF agents and so on, that the, the tanks would be fired on. He also said that the doors were blocked. I think that was fairly predictable, that doors would be blocked because of a fear of an assault, particularly uh, once the gas insertion in the tanks uh, started. He said that seven of the nine people who escaped, escaped because holes were punched in the wall once they realized the doors were blocked. Uh, we also learned that uh, uh, Mr. Jamar also told me in one of my questions that he didn't, in fact, know where the children were. In fact, where they hoped they were in the bus, they weren't, but there was no way for them to know where in the compound before they uh, put the gas in to know where the children were. We also knew, and uh, both the FBI and all the e outside experts knew that Koresh had a, a tendency to uh, talk in uh, Masonic terms about fire, uh, that we learned also that the FBI did not hear the tape and that there was really no way because it, that equipment wasn't checked or planned in advance to hear whether or not they were starting a fire during that time. I think we all agree that Koresh was a paranoid pervert with the messianic uh, complex, but given that, it seems fairly logical that once the walls were being knocked down that uh, broadcasting over a loudspeaker, we are not assaulting your compound, isn't going to cut it, uh, that an average person, if their walls were getting knocked down in their home, would consider that an assault and possibly precipitate you know, his radical actions that he in fact did, which was uh, start a fire in the complex. We also heard from Dr. Salem, who did, he did not say that the gas was safe. He said that uh, there was, I think the FBI report says that there's uh, no laboratory tests and anecdotal evidence was convincing that there would be no permanent in injury. The gentleman from Britain said that the anecdotal evidence was mixed but the scientific evidence suggested that it probably wouldn't be. I've been going back and forth between an FDA oversight hearing on uh, uh, breast implants where the FDA has, taken the uh, FDA has taken a position that they shouldn't be allowed because there's no compelling research to say that it's safe, not that it's proven that it's dangerous, the research is mixed. At best, what Dr. Salem said was 
48 hours who seem to have recovered. That's the scientific evidence, even at the anecdotal level on, on that side. And he, when asked by Mrs. Collins, said that uh, if gas had to be used, CS gas was the safest gas. He did not say he approved of using the gas. Furthermore, you acknowledged, and we all know, there were no gas masks for the children. We heard Clive Doyle say that, uh, uh, describe what it was like inside, uh, pitch black, rolling around, uh, trying to figure out where a hole had been knocked in the wall, hearing screaming behind him. There was no chance that those children were going to escape unless just by chance they were at one of those holes, all of which the FBI said was a plan that was signed off on in advance. When I asked Joyce Sparks, who was the only person to have gone in, was very frustrated because she believed that Koresh, the parents were shielding uh, Koresh and that nobody would come forth, but I asked her about the President's quote. But in the end, the last comment I had from Janet Reno was when I said, I want you to tell me once more why you believe we should move now rather than wait some more. And she said, it is because of the children. I asked Joy Sparks whether she thought that was true, and she said no. She didn't think it was because of the children. For four days, you valiantly tried to hold them off from going in. Uh, you asked the questions repeatedly of the children. I can understand why with the White House asking questions and the, the political problems of a hostage a situation which we've gone through in this country in multiple different ways. I can understand with the FBI being tired why there might have been decisions made to go ahead and that quite frankly they had given up hope and there may not have been another way to get Koresh out. I certainly don't have any suggestions. But I would suggest that after all these hearings it is not believable to say that the reason you went in was because of the children. This evidence is just too overwhelming. You're quite correct, sir, and let me tell you why we went in. You apparently were not here earlier. We were faced with a situation where they had been there for 51 days, dangerous people who had killed four ATF agents and wounded 15. I could not walk away from it. I tried to consider what alternatives, because since March 21st, no other children, nobody else had come out except some people that had gone in. And it was clear based on interviews that the people who had come out either were not Koresh's adopted or biological children or they were adults who were causing him trouble. The FBI submitted a gas plan. The questions I asked immediately were, what about the gas? This report was not enough. I explored additional information. I researched everything that I knew to do through the FBI in terms of toxicology, in terms of the impact, and was told it would not produce permanent harm. That was one of the keys before I ever considered any further aspect of it. I considered at the time what the military commanders of the military HRT team and the FBI was saying about the stated readiness of the HRT team. And I was surprised to find that there was only one team, that I could not pull back the one team and substitute another. I asked if I could substitute, they could substitute the SWAT teams, and they said no, the training was not of, of a standard that would permit the security for the perimeter, and they were very concerned about the security in terms of intruders or people coming to assist or to attack the Davidians. That was another factor. I then said, well, why can't we wait and see, you know, let's starve them out or they'll run out of water. We were told by people who were coming out that they had a supply of food that could last up till a year, that their water supply, I asked the FBI to go back because there was some indication from the electronic surveillance that they might be short of water. They did tests through some type of equipment and found that the water supply was being replenished in excess of the amount of rainfall on a regular basis and that that seemed to be adequate. I'd look for other alternatives as to what to do. One of the things that struck me from the beginning and gave me such sleepless nights was the fact that he had talked about suicide. Instead of coming out on March the 2nd, he had rehearsed a suicide attempt where he would come out with explosives on, blow himself and some agents up while the others committed suicide inside. That could have happened then, it could happen 10 days from then, it could happen six months from then. It was hard to tell based on all his writings, based on the evaluation of the writings. But I then weighed with that the statement he made, and I read transcripts where he said, I'm not going to commit suicide, it's against my teachings. I weighed all of these factors, the condition of the children and the others there, the fact that there had been allegations of, of sexual abuse, there had been allegations of beatings. I weighed it all, and consistent with the HRT telling me that unless they pull back shortly,
they would not be at the state of readiness necessary to secure the compound, I made the judgment that at this point it was, we would have the best opportunity to control any situation that Koresh might develop. What haunted me was that if I did not go in, I might be sitting there 10 days from then when he came out with explosives, blew himself, some agents, and the entire place up. So those were the, the factors that went into my decision. Thank Mr. you, and I, I hope I can answer in the second round a couple well, of follow-ups to that. The next round you will get that opportunity. Your time for now has expired. Mr. Taylor, we do not have but one other Republican questioner, so I'll yield you uh, your five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Reno, you've had the opportunity now to look at this for a couple of years. And one thing we know is for certain that, that a young man born almost on Christmas Day in 1962 named Conway LeBlue is dead. Another one born in October of 64 named Todd McKeehan is dead. Another one born March 1st of 1966 named Robert Williams is dead. And another one born a week before Christmas in 1960 named Stephen Willis is dead. There were ATF agents who were paid by the people of this land to enforce the laws of this land. Laws like kidnapping, laws like sexually mistreating children, laws against owning machine guns unless you have a license for that, laws against threatening other people with death or elimination as the good Mr. Koresh like to use. Now having looked at all those things for the past two and a half years, has there been anything that you've seen or read or heard that would justify the murder of those four ATF agents? or the wounding of 20 more, or in any way remove the guilt of David Koresh for surrounding himself with 80 people as human shields, 80 people who died at his wish? No, sir, not one solitary fact. I'm curious, I, this is, I remember as a state senator and as the city councilman back in Mississippi, we required our law enforcement officers to take an oath of office to enforce all laws. Even if it was something like bingo, back when bingo was illegal in Mississippi, uh, even though it was pretty popular with the, the grandmas and the grandpas, they had to enforce the bingo laws. Even when the state was a dry state and a lot of people liked to drink, they had to enforce the liquor laws. Do FBI agents and ATF agents take an, an oath of, to enforce all the laws, whether they like them or not? Yes, sir. And we are the rule of law, am I not mistaken, Ms. Reno, Ms. Reno, where everyone in this country, be they a congressman or a guy who's sweeping streets, they got to live by the same laws? That's right, sir. So is there anything that you have seen that allows a guy who was sleeping with 10-year-old little girls, who had threatened to kill his ex-members who left to talk to the police, who held at least one person against their will for three months, who killed four ATF agents and wounded 20 more. Is there anything that justifies what he did or somehow makes him above the law because he had some perverted sense that he called religion? Nothing whatsoever, sir. Ms. Reno, I'm only going to ask for one thing. I was disappointed when I read that the federal government spent a considerable sum of money, and, and after all was said and done in the hearings down in the, the trial against the Davidians, that there were no murder convictions against those Davidians. I have read the same evidence as the people in this room. I've seen the same evidence as people in this same room. And I've come to be convinced that four good people died trying to serve a legal warrant using military equipment that was legally supplied to them and yet no one was convicted of it. It is your belief, now that you've had two years to look at it, that those people who survived were not involved in the crime or were no more guilty than they were found guilty of? The matter is now pending on appeal, so it is probably appropriate that I not comment too extensively on the verdicts, except to say that the verdicts of the court with respect to certain of the defendants, makes clear that what they did was not justified and not excused. Ms. Reno, if I may make one request as a congressman from one state, I wish you would put together a team that would have the job of enforcing the laws when 
law enforcement agents are killed in the line of duty, of being the people that will prosecute that law. Because I don't want to see one more cop killer walk free. And I hope no one in this room does either. Thank you, Ms. Reno. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Your time has expired. To uh, conclude the questioning on the first round, I will yield to Mr. Shabbat five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think we all agree with Mr. Taylor that it's absolutely a tragedy that four law enforcement officials lost their lives and our hearts go out to the families uh, of, those, of those men. Um, one thing that bothers me, and I think a lot of people, uh, was the nature, the, the high-risk nature of the final assault on the uh, Davidian complex, particularly uh, when we know that there were 20 innocent children uh, in that particular facility. Uh, and again, I have no sympathy for Koresh. I have no sympathy for any of the other adults who were using weapons in that facility. They were guilty of sin. But the children were completely innocent uh, in this particular uh, incident. And what, what I wonder, and some other people I think wonder, is that had this been a a, say a school bus had been going down in front of the compound and, and a school bus of kids had been hijacked by the Davidians and taken inside and were taken hostage, for example. Um, under those circumstances, uh, is it conceivable uh, that our government would have acted as it did uh, by gassing the compound and assaulting the building with tanks, knowing that there were such significant risks involved, particularly the risk of fire, had they been a school bus of, of citizens as opposed to children of, of these Davidians? If instead of a raid on the 28th, he had taken the children into the compound and 51 days had gone by and he'd not let any of the children out, and on March the 2nd he had rehearsed a suicide plan where he would come out with explosives strapped to his waist and blow up the agents outside while the group inside committed suicide along with the 20 children who had been uh, kidnapped by him. I would have pursued the issue in the same way, trying to make the best judgment I could as to the most effective, propitious time to take action to try to get those children out okay. safely. Thank you. So the answer is yes. And it, the, the suicide incident you talked to was March 2nd, so that was three or so days after the initial raid and for 48 days uh, obviously, that, that hadn't occurred, and, and nobody died within the facility until the government actually took its action. And, and I have, there's no question that, that, that you were acting as, as you best thought was right, and I think we all agree that. Uh, obviously, it was a terrible tragedy that ultimately occurred, though. Um, as you know, General Reno, one of, one of the central purposes of these hearings uh, is to try to learn whatever lessons we can from the debacle at Waco. And, and one issue that we keep uh, coming back to uh, is the question of accountability, individual accountability. And, and one person's name who's come up a number of times in these hearings uh, is that of Larry Potts. And of course, Mr. Potts at the time of Waco was the assistant director of the criminal investigative division of the FBI. Um, and he was at most of the important meetings uh, in which the urging of CS gas uh, occurred. Um, now, this followed uh, by only about eight weeks Mr. Potts's uh, tragic involvement uh, at Ruby Ridge, the uh, Randy Weaver case. Um, and the rules of engagement, uh, as is coming out now, uh, were such that it, I think everyone agrees it was unconstitutional. I think by your own department's evaluation, the rules of engagement uh, were improper there. But that operation round, wound up with a, a mother shot through the head by an FBI sniper uh, as, as she was actually holding an, an infant in her arms. Um, and, and Mr. Potts was accused by two FBI agents of lying to cover up, uh, according to news accounts, and he, and he was disciplined by your department. Uh, Mr. Potts, after Ruby Ridge then, uh, was a, he then had the Waco responsibilities, and we saw the tragedy that resulted there. Uh, in the wake of those two disasters, uh, you approved Mr. Potts' promotion to the number two post at the FBI, uh, even amidst allegations of a cover-up in, in the Weaver case, the Ruby, uh, Ruby Ridge case. Now, Mr. Potts only served as deputy FBI director for 10 weeks until he was recently demoted. Within the past couple of weeks, he was demoted. Um, didn't his promotion send exactly the wrong message if you're trying to establish some notion of accountability within the department? Yes, I had put it 
if I'm trying to establish accountability, what I did was to review his work uh, at Waco, since that's what we're focusing on. And it was, I have not, in, as I go over everything with respect to Waco, all those hours, those days, the FBI, including Mr. Potts, was dedicated. They tried their best. They gave me their best judgment. They pursued every factual inquiry that I came up with. And from my understanding, Mr. Potts has been here, testified before you, and has been accountable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shabbat. Uh, your time has expired. We're now going to commence the second round of questioning at this point. Uh, everybody has had an opportunity to have five minutes in the first round. I will yield myself five minutes to commence this second round. Ms. Reno, I have listened very attentively during your testimony this morning, and I've heard you say four things that particularly stand out about what contributed most to your decision on the 17th of April. The belief that there really was an impasse in the negotiations, the fatigue of the hostage rescue team, and the need to put them in downtime at some point soon, uh, concern over the condition of the children and the possibility they were continue to be abused, and the fear of an imminent violent breakout uh, by Korish if you waited uh, and let him do it on his terms. There are other factors, but those four I've heard you say pretty strongly. What bothers me about what you've said so far is that the evidence we've taken over the last eight days before today does not corroborate or substantiate the basis for any one of the four. First of all, with regard to the impasse, yes, I'm convinced that the FBI really believed there was an impasse, and I don't doubt that you believe them. But the fact of the matter is we've had a lot of evidence that would indicate that Koresh really was serious this time about coming out. David, uh, or I guess Mr. DeGuerin, his attorney, was very impassioned and, and very believable, very credible here the other day when he told us that he honestly believed that Koresh would have been out within 10 days or so if the raid, if the assault had not occurred. We have also know from the transcripts there was a lot going on of hustling and bustling, though the FBI dismissed that. Uh, we do know that there were problems with the typewriter, there was no electricity, etc. And even though Dr. Myron, uh, who was your consultant, did say he thought with other FBI officials that this might be a ploy to gain more time, uh, he also said that he believed that Koresh was working feverish, feverishly, as he put it on the transcripts uh, and his interpretations of the seven seals, and that it was a potentially very valuable negotiating tool. We had Dick Rogers, the head of the hostage rescue team, tell us that he had about two weeks left before there would have to be a stand down of the hostage rescue team. I would submit that considering what Mr. DeGarren had to say, that was a very critical two weeks. As far as the uh, imminence, uh, or let's put it this way, about the kids being abused, there is no evidence we've had that the children were under any more abuse or physical harm threat during the time of the siege than, they, than existed prior to the siege, than existed prior to the raid on February 28th for that matter. Sanitary conditions weren't good in there, but nobody apparently was getting ill. And as you've stated yourself, there was a plentiful supply of food and apparently adequate water from rainwater, as best we could determine, adequate but, but not good. And as far as the fear of an imminent violent breakout, if you waited, is concerned, the only thing I've heard, is, and you've repeated it today, is this concern of March the 2nd, where Koresh apparently, according to one division who came out, uh, was planning or had made indications he wanted to come out that day with the explosives tied around him and might blow himself up. In, as Mr. Shabbat has pointed out in the intervening, well, 49 days until the 19th of April, there was not one shred of evidence that Koresh was implementing such a plan. We've heard nothing to indicate that he was considering that any longer. And it bothers me a lot that you and the FBI have relied upon that factor, that fear, or that concern as the rationale for going ahead at this particular moment in time. It seems to me that indeed you had an opportunity, uh, as I asked in my first round of questions, to personally get involved and talk to Mr. DeGarren, Koresh's attorney, talk to Mr. Sage personally, talk with Mr. Jamar personally. I think if you'd done that, and I know that I'm hindsight guessing you now, you would have found that that certainty about an impasse would not have been so great in your mind. 
I'm bothered by that. And I'm bothered by the fact that, that you were pressed to, in your mind to act anyway. Uh, I just don't think that facts corroborate the basis upon which you have told us today you've made this decision. Now, I want to ask you a question about the actual assault uh, itself and the planning of that assault. My question is this. It seems to me that in the process of looking at this plan, it was early on decided, and it's clear from the plan itself, that if the, the uh, Bradley vehicles and the CEVs were fired upon, the plan would be accelerated. And there was a general understanding by Mr. Clark at the FBI, who was then the deputy director, and I think others there, that an accelerated plan was a higher risk plan. He was very concerned and told us that, that the Davidians might react negatively to that kind of uh, a more aggressive assault. And that's why initially that apparently hadn't gotten brought up to you as early as it might otherwise have been brought up to you. And it seems as though internally in the FBI the idea of a slow implementation plan was the desired thing and that's what they promoted. Yet Mr. Jamar told us that he was 99% certain that when those vehicles approached the compound, they would be fired upon. And under the plan, it would be accelerated. I do not see why you would not have seen the same thing Mr. Jamar saw in this. Uh, he did say he didn't pass his thoughts on to anybody else. So I don't doubt for a minute that you got th those words. You didn't. Uh, that, that thought didn't go up. Uh, neither Mr. Potts nor Mr. Clark nor anyone else that I could find, maybe you did, you may tell me I, somebody else I didn't ask passed that thought on to you, but I don't think that Mr. Jamar expressed that thought to any superior. But it seems to me logical that one would assume and that you yourself should have assumed that the plan would have been accelerated almost uh, to a probability because of the fact that surely after the ATF officers had been shot in the raid on February 28th, one would have to assume the likelihood that these vehicles would indeed be fired on. And with that higher risk involved, uh, what my question is, were you thinking, yes, it is probable, the risk of that are, are there, but I'm going to take that chance anyway. Uh, will we let the, uh, the events unfold? We've just got to come to an end to this. Or did you really think, despite all that I have analyzed with you, that when those vehicles approached up there that the insertion of that gas would uh, in all probability be a slow unfolding and that the plan would be carried out over the 48 hours rather than over the uh, what turned out to be six hours but a much accelerated plan. First of all let me make clear to you that I did not feel pressed to make a decision except by the facts. Secondly let me make sure that you have said that I made a mistake no one will ever know whether you had been in the same position using the same analysis that you have made today, you would have made a mistake. With respect to the first issue that you raised, you don't think that there was an impasse in negotiations. What Mr. Sage said, as I understand his testimony here, was that they had reached an impasse in negotiations in terms of anybody coming out voluntarily. That and I don't think there's any doubt about that. He wanted to continue to negotiate, I wanted to continue to negotiate, and it was our hope that with the pressure of the gas, it would produce the possibility of negotiations, if not getting them all out. As you look over all the transcripts, over all the time, it's easy for you to take a piece here and a piece here and wishful thinking, say, gee, if I had been the Attorney General, uh, this is the way it would have worked. And uh, I wish, if it had turned out right, that that had been the case. But what I was faced with was not the ability to Monday morning quarterback. I was faced with a situation in which he said he had rehearsed the plan March 2nd. There have been continuing concerns about suicide based on some of his messianic writing. Chairman Hyde refers to this. And that I didn't know what circumstances might exist that would produce that an attack from the outside, an intruder, a fight, a response, that this was the best time to use the resources we had to encourage further negotiation. Secondly, with respect to the fatigue, it was never expressed to me in terms of fatigue, it was expressed to me in terms of a state of readiness, in terms of their sharpshooting ability and the like. Mm -hmm. What was expressed to me is that they might have a little bit longer, but that this was their best time in order to properly 
hold the perimeter. But what I was faced with was here was a man on March 2nd who had said he would come out. He was very explicit. He said he would come out immediately. The tape was broadcast. And what did he do? I'm sorry, I'm not coming out. God told me to wait. He said he was coming out soon, around March 19th or 20th. He never came out. He said he was coming out after Passover. After Passover, he suddenly comes out with the fact that he's going to do the seven seals. I went through the transcripts to see, after the fact, to engage in some Monday morning quarterbacking myself. And it was so clear those days following the end of his Passover, or what he referred to as Passover, trying to get some signal, trying to find out when is he coming out, what is he going to do. He could take forever to finish the seals, as Stephen Schneider said, six months or six years. We will never know the answer, but the record is replete with equivocation, with broken promise of him just toying and manipulating the whole system. I'm willing to be toyed with and be manipulated if I can maintain a perimeter. And obviously, with the, what we have learned, we now have a capacity so that if I would have the HRT capacity and the SWAT capacity to wait longer and would have done so then, because that was one of the very points of the equation. With respect to the kids being abused, I have never suggested that there was more abuse after the raid than there was before the raid. What I was concerned about are allegations that have been supported that children were being sexually abused and that children were being beaten. And children kept under those circumstances for six months to a year without being able to get out. That's not a good condition for children. Uh, with respect to talking to DeGaron, to Sage, and to Jamar, I could talk to them till I'm blue in the face, but my whole point is, from all that I have learned, the factors are still there. Everything that has come up has been part of the factor in terms of trying to understand it. We will never know what happened. If I could wave a magic wand and do it over again and have the right answer, I'd feel like I was the most fortunate person in the world. Do you uh, want to respond to the last uh, question I asked? I know you responded to my analysis. I really, the question I asked pertained to the issue of the question of your belief of, of whether or not that plan to use the gas would be I accelerated almost as a probability because you would, would have assumed or would you not have assumed that this um, would have, they would have been fired upon by the Davidians? If I understand your question, and I had a little bit down a little bit differently, I think what they were trying to do, I think they faced an unusual situation where the gas did not appear to be working because the wind was very high and they were worried that people did not have the opportunity to get out because they had barred doors. I, in terms of knocking down the doors, nothing happened. They moved slowly. Nothing happened for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. I think it was an appropriate effort to ensure that there was egress from the, the, the compound. The, the question, and I don't want to belabor it because my time has expired, and I, you've, you've spent a lot of time obviously analyzing my analysis, and I understand that maybe I should not have asked the question at the end I did. But what my question at the end was, was pertaining to a comment made to us by Mr. Jamar, the tactical commander, who told us that he was 99% certain in his own mind that when the gas uh, inserting vehicles approached that compound, they would be fired upon. And my real question to you is whether he didn't pass it on to you as far as I know. I mean, everybody here said they didn't hear it from him. He didn't say it to anybody. Wouldn't it have been reasonable for you to think about that yourself in light of the fact they'd fired on the ATF? Uh, wouldn't it a probability, just as Majar uh, Jamar thought, and did you have that same thought he did, that, that they would be fired on? And if you did, would that have not implied that to your thinking at the time you made your decision that this was going to inevitably be an accelerated uh, gas in, uh, assault from the beginning? That's we, the question. We speculated on that from the beginning because one of the things that I was concerned about is that they would put children up in the, the window and use them as shields to fire on agents below. And I said if they put the children in the window, back off immediately. But what we were faced with here was a situation in which we expected them to fire. 
in perhaps in in certain instances we wouldn't have had the people in the armored vehicles well, that's what i would think mr schumer well, mr scott mr scott you're recognized for five minutes thank you mr chairman now give one minute to the gentleman from new york mr schumer thank you gentlemen and as we begin this second round of questioning i just want to say to you Madam Attorney General, that you have done a, I think, a very fine job of forthrightly explaining your position and what happened. Before these hearings began, it was no secret around town that some said they were going to bring you here to embarrass you or humiliate you. The Washington Post on July 16th, Attorney General Janet Reno was the sole witness on the hearings last day, and some Republican staff members privately express hope they can humiliate her. Newsweek, July 31st, Republicans have cast her as the climactic witness in what they hope will be a high-profile humiliation. Associated Press, July 28th, some Republicans privately concede they hope to use Waco hearings to embarrass the administration. What I want to say is you haven't been embarrassed or humiliated at all. You've stood strong and tall. The only embarrassment and humiliation came in a few moments from incidents like the gas mask incident, which was not your doing. I just have one question for you. And that is, you've sat here all morning. You've read, I'm sure, the accounts of the hearings for the last nine days. You've probably listened to some. Have you learned anything different or new that would have led you, that lead you to think differently of the decision you made? First of all, I have to say as a matter of personal privilege that I don't know that many other members of, I've had dealings with uh, a number of the members, and I don't, think that they would embarrass me. I know for sure Chairman McCollum would never would. be out to humiliate me. I agree. Hear, hear. Um, and if he tried, he couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can uh, assure you, if I might, I've not tried to humiliate you today. I've tried to ask kind of questions, but we do have time that you I have just, Mr. Scott. So the question I asked is, had you learned anything new? Uh, from the, sitting here this morning or well, been, in reading the accounts that would have led you to make a different decision? I've been doing an awful lot of the talking, so it, it's, I'm trying to, to furnish the information. What I have done, I have not been able to see that much of the hearings, and I've asked for reports. We're going to go over everything to see if there's anything that we should follow up on, because I am very sincere in what I said to the Judiciary Committee two years ago and what I say now, whatever we can do to work together to avoid tragedies like this in the future, we want to try to do that. Thank you. I want to get back to the uh, situation of the gas. Just very briefly, we've heard about the 48 hours of um, gas insertion plan. Was it the plan to insert gas for a constant 48 hours? I I think that's a very good question because what happened, first of all, was the wind was much higher than anybody anticipated and you could see the curtains at, at right angles. It was hoped that the gas would be inserted in a very measured way, that it would force some people out. Our anticipation was that people would come out, would straggle out some faster than others and that we would increase the the pressure to limit them in space so that they would react to the gas. But I think what happened here is that the wind was much higher, the gas was dispersed much more quickly, it didn't have an impact, they were concerned because people weren't coming out that perhaps their way was blocked, but it was to be a very measured process trying, and the total expectation based on my conversations with the HRT team, based on my conversations with the military commanders and with Dr. Salem, was that people would react to the gas much more quickly. We've heard uh, the gentleman from Indiana mention the uh, background with CS gas. CN gas has been proven, documented to kill people from time to time, but there's been no documented case of anyone suffering long-term medical implications from exposure to CS gas, although it is very traumatic, obviously, when you're under the uh, effects. Um, although it is physically safe. We've also heard testimony that it is very difficult to predict what someone will do under its influence. Some will panic, some may not panic, but it's very difficult to predict. Uh, had this difficulty in predicting someone's reaction been taken into consideration as you developed your plan? 
we took it into consider not the panic so much, but if, if a child came out without a parent or vice versa, those circumstances, we tried to consider what could be done. Uh, and again, there was the anticipation that the gas would have a much more immediate impact than it did. Ms. Ringland, there was testimony earlier, and I don't know how much of it you've heard, but I, I know you're aware of it. Subject matter of a letter that had been written to you by the uh, AUSA down there, and that is the state of relations between the FBI and the Texas Rangers and possibly with some of the other uh, agencies that was causing some problems. And uh, Commander Maurice Cook, the senior captain and uh, commander of the Texas Ranger Division of the Texas Department of Public Safety talked about this the other day. And one of the questions uh, that he uh, was uh, responded to uh, during his testimony was uh, that the governor of Texas uh, had, had furnished him a number at the White House uh, should he need to address certain concerns concerning cooperation with the FBI. That struck a number of us as somewhat odd at the, at the time. Uh, that the governor would be referring him to somebody at the White House as opposed to the director of the FBI or yourself or somebody at, at Justice. And I'd like to have a letter uh, shown to you if I could, please. Uh, this is a letter that we received, I think just today or late yesterday, from Commander Cook of the Texas uh, Ranger Division, uh, in which he says that uh, in further response to Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, please. Uh, that in further response to uh, Chairman Zealous' uh, further inquiry, that the name of the person to whom he was referred by the governor of Texas to address certain concerns that he might have with regard to the FBI and the Waco situation was Vince Foster. Uh, and then he's given a number at, at the White House. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any knowledge as to, as to why he would be referred to the White House, in particular Vince Foster, uh, concerning problems that might have cropped up during the Waco uh, siege. I would have no idea why the governor would do that. Okay. Uh, this morning, uh, during the Whitewater hearings, it's my understanding that uh, Mr. Foster's secretary, Deborah Gorham, I think is her name, uh, testified that, uh, that Mr. Foster maintained a Waco file in his uh, locked file cabinet. Uh, and I further believe that that file does not turn up in uh, the White House's accounting of uh, files maintained by Mr. Foster in the wake of his uh, unfortunate suicide. Uh, do you have any knowledge of whether or not he maintained a Waco file? I have no idea, sir. Uh, do you have any knowledge as to uh, what might have happened to any such file? No, I don't. Does it strike you at all odd that questions regarding the, the FBI, which comes under your jurisdiction, uh, regarding an investigation as serious as this one, would be referred not to the FBI, not to the Department of Justice, but to the White House. I don't know what the timing of it was, sir, whether I was in office or not. Okay, what, when were you sworn into office? March 12, 1993. Okay. And uh, were you in an acting capacity prior to that in any... No, sir. The acting attorney general was Stuart Gerson, who was from the previous administration. Okay. The testimony of uh, Commander Cook was that during this time period, uh, and that is between February 28th, the initial raid, and then going into the, into the siege, because the Texas Rangers had been uh, provided the jurisdiction or had been, uh, as a matter of fact, I think he said some of his men were, uh, were deputized as, uh, as special uh, assistant uh, marshals or deputy U.S. marshals in order to conduct a continuing investigation of the, of the murders of the agents. So this was a situation that developed, uh, and I don't know that it had to do with any one particular day or whatnot, uh, but you had no knowledge of, of Ben Foster's involvement in, in this. No, sir, I didn't. I, I don't know what the timing was because I didn't get there until March 12th. You had a very unusual situation in the Department of Justice because you didn't have a, an attorney general nominated until February the 11th. The confirmation process then took the ensuing time. 
and there was an acting attorney general, Mr. Stuart Gerson, who was a holdover from the prior administration, so that there may have been concerns uh, about appropriate communication. I don't know. Okay. Uh, the investigation of Waco obviously continues even, even today, uh, and certainly both the Departments of Justice and the Department of Treasury uh, were maintained of act, active investigations uh, which resulted in uh, the respective departments issuing voluminous reports in late 1993. So during the period of time uh, in which uh, Mr. Foster died, there was continuing activity within the administration, at least within two departments thereof, concerning Waco. Uh, had Mr. Foster maintained a file on Waco in his office at the time of his death, uh, and if in fact uh, that file disappeared, uh, would that give, give some, raise some question in your mind as, as to why or that it ought to be looked into why such a file disappeared? I don't know, sir. You, you don't know whether that would raise a question in your I, mind? I don't know what the file was. Let's, let's just say a file that had documents pertaining to Waco in it, which it's would be illogical to presume if it said Waco. I would have to check and see what the testimony was this morning and understand it. The, the testimony where? Whatever, to, I, this is the first time I've heard about a Waco file, so I would have to be informed in order to make a decision. Mr. Well, your time has expired. Mr. Watt, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Watt, do you wish your time? You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I made a mistake this morning, uh, Madam Attorney General, of getting off on some factual issues related to your initial testimony. and. Uh, while the responses were excellent and good and informative, I want to make sure that I get to the things that I really wanted to deal with this morning having to do with the seven recommendations that uh, or action items, I guess, you have taken in response to uh, the incidents that occurred at Waco. I noticed that um, the first four of those uh, action items, um, the ones listed on page six of your initial statement, all relate to um, uh, involvement of additional people in the process. Uh, 30 senior agents uh, um, for additional training in hostage barricade situations, increasing the size, composition, and equipment of the hostage rescue team, um, FBI increased the number of negotiators. FBI has formed a critical incident response group. Uh, and one of the questions I wanted to ask um, uh, is whether uh, any of that additional training and personnel um, is the emphasis in any of that uh, training those people in the um, having a clear understanding of personal and individual rights and liberties, uh, the Fourth Amendment and exclusionary rule and the value that that plays uh, in the process. Uh, I would just like to be reassured that, that uh, the, the lessons that, uh, that some of us have tried to make during the context of this hearing, that our federal government really appreciates the value of the Fourth Amendment protections and constitutional protections uh, and their safeguards and the way they are safeguarded through the exclusionary rule are being reinforced to any new personnel that comes into uh, this kind of situation? Well, first of all, they're being reinforced with new personnel coming into the law enforcement agencies of the Department of Justice. I've put set great store on our whole training program. I've visited Quantico. I'm doing everything I can to work with Director Free to make sure that Quantico, as well as the other federal agencies uh, under the Marshal, uh, the Marshal Service and the Border Patrol, which train at Glencoe, are, have a curriculum that addresses the issue of, of constitutional guarantees and that it does it well. So I, I feel comfortable there. With respect to the HRT and the SWAT teams, I don't know whether there is additional training over and above and beyond with respect to constitutional issues, but I know in my conversations with Director Free, in my conversations with uh, the head of the Crisis Incident Review Group, that human life is paramount. 
and the protection of human life is paramount to what we're doing. Okay, uh, your response leads me uh, actually to the second question that I already had. It didn't provoke the second question, and that was your, your reference to the SWAT uh, teams. Um, does, does that SWAT team, is that an acronym for something? I, I always have these visions in my own mind of when I hear the word SWAT team of, of uh, people shooting at folks. And I, I just want to, is that an acronym for something? I don't know what the, it's a special weapons attack team or something like that. Special weapons attack team, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just, uh, um, I guess one of the concerns uh, a lot of people in the public express to me is, uh, is this notion that uh, the government is getting more and more armed and, and dangerous to us, to us citizens. Uh, um, uh, what kind of training is being provided to the HRT and, and uh, SWAT team uh, members? It's special weapons and tactics. Special weapons, weapons and, and tactics. tactics. That may that sounds like a lot better to me than than uh, attack team. I, I, it really does. What the director is trying to do, and and he really should uh, address the, this issue directly. But what we're trying to do is to develop the capacity with the crisis incident response team, working with these enhanced SWAT teams, to understand the behavioral issues to understand the issues that may help us to negotiate out a peaceful resolution of these matters. From my experience, if you have a well-trained team that can respond, that can work as a partner with the negotiators where they are truly on the same team, you can be more effective. And the director is absolutely dedicated to doing everything he can to enhance the capacity of these teams to save human life. And Can you just tell me one more time what SWAT stands special for? Special Weapons and Tactics. Okay, Special right. Weapons and Tactics. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. After all these days, Mr. Watt. Your time has expired. Mr. Hyde, you're recognized for five minutes. I bet Mr. Schumer knew what those letters stood for. Uh, I'll bet Mr. Schumer knew what those letters stood for, SWAT. You'll never know. <laughs> Incidentally, um, I just uh, want Mr. Schumer to know how much I uh, am unhappy with his quoting anonymous staffers making insulting remarks about uh, the Attorney General. He knows no Republican member would talk that way. Is that stupid or that mean-spirited? And uh, it just isn't helpful. Uh, if there's any comedy left around here, um, quoting garbage like that isn't helpful. Uh, and the I yield to the gentleman. AP to the gentleman. Their quotes, not mine. Yeah, well, they, they don't help this discussion. Now, um, General, we're nearing the end, and I know there's no one who desires that more than you because this has been exhausting and you've done <coughs> exceptionally well. But as we reach the end, I. Uh, uh, I think you have said there's nothing you would do differently um, knowing what you know now. Is that true? There are three parts to that, Mr. Chairman. First of all, knowing what I do now and having enhanced the capacity of the SWAT team and the HRT team, I would do what I would hope I could have done then, which was bring in another HRT team or a complement that could ensure... Well, I'm, I'm not talking about okay, but changing circum... I mean, what happened at that time and place? Knowing what okay, you know I'm, now. I'm trying to, to, to take it point by point. All right. Secondly, knowing what I know now, I would wait and take the risk of the impaired perimeter. Okay. I, I, I think what you're saying is that the behavioral science people who had this exactly right uh, and whose reports you were given on April 17th I think you would have, the behavioral scientists, Peter Smerick and uh, this gentleman named Young and others, you would have paid more attention to what they said because they hit the nail on the head. Smerick and I'm quoting from the justice report, Smerick and Young noted this was not a typical hostage situation in that the hostages in this situation 
wanted to be barricade inside with their leader and had no intention of leaving. Given this dynamic, Smerich, FBI behavioral scientist, and Young suggested a different approach. In traditional hostage situations, a strategy which has been successful has been negotiations coupled with ever-increasing tactical presence. In this situation, it is believed this strategy, if carried to excess, could be counterproductive and could result in loss of life. Smerich and Young explained that if the FBI could not establish some trust with Koresh, the FBI would face the possibility of eventually taking physical action against the compound. If such an attack could play, took place, Koresh and his followers will fight back to the death to defend their property and their faith as they believe they did on February 28th. And then quoting from page 183 of the Justice Report, Smerich, again, he wrote the memos because he was concerned that the FBI commanders were moving too rapidly toward a tactical solution and not allowing adequate time for negotiations to work. Now, I say that knowing he had 51 days, and that must have seemed like an eternity, especially in the, on the plains of Waco. But, I, but to go on, Smerich notes that the FBI commanders were action-oriented. They wanted to treat Koresh not as a negotiating partner, but rather as a psychotic criminal who needed to be caught and punished. Now, there were five reports, uh, as I understand it, analyzing from that perspective this situation. And I say, had I been in your situation, I might well have done exactly as you, had done, as you did. So I'm not being judgmental. But in looking back at this, these fellows who, who understood that these weapons were stockpiled in anticipation of an apocalyptic confrontation with Babylon, which happened to be our government. Um, they believed an aggressive assault plan would dramatically increase the paranoia and the fear of the Davidians. It's a shame, and I regret, and I hope you regret, that you, you didn't look at this from the point of view of how would the reasonable Davidian react to this assault with the tear gas uh, not how the reasonable person would react. And, and do, have I made myself clear? And, and wouldn't you pay more attention to these behavioral scientists than evidently you did? I think you've made yourself clear, but I think we're a little bit confused in time. Mr. Smerich's remarks, as I understand it, and as I was advised, were developed in early March when there was tension between the negotiators and the tactical people. My concern when they were, con they con and I was unaware of that tension, when the gas plan was submitted to me, I began to hear about some of the tension. That's what caused me to follow up and to make sure that we had talked to negotiators to make sure that there was nothing else that could be done to try to negotiate people out short of adding the pressure. As I understand it, Mr. Smerich testified before the committee uh, that the FBI did not move at that particular time that you've raised, and for the longest period of time went over and beyond what normal negotiators might consider doing in a situation like this, in my experience in the past of working with negotiators in similar crises. For instance, the idea of bringing in attorneys to deal with the offender is unheard of. The idea of bringing in religious experts to discuss the matter with the offender is unheard of, and yet the FBI considered all these options. The FBI did not ignore my memos, and in fact, that did in fact follow many of the suggestions I made. Well, what I was faced with, Mr. Chairman, was that was passed. I came in March 12th. They, the t tensions had developed. When I was confronted with those tensions, that's when we talked to SAGE to make sure that nothing more could be done. <coughs> in retrospect, if I had been the Attorney General on February 28th, I would have knowing everything that I know now, and perhaps even not in retrospect, because negotiation was key to us, try to work it out, work it out, work it out. It continued to be up until the morning we went in. It continued to be through that morning. But what we have tried to do in response to that is to develop the capacity of negotiators and tactical people in the crisis incident review team and re review group to have that teamwork 
that is so necessary in understanding how you negotiate, but how you increase pressure when it's appropriate. Well, my time's up. Thank you. Mr. Hyde, your time is up. Ms. Lofgren, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to yield a minute to Mr. Schumer, who had a question. Fine. It's not a question. I just thought I'd clarify more innuendos that come up at this late hour. The so-called file, Foster file, uh, it consisted of one document. We saw it. Mr. Zellif, Mr. McCollum, uh, Ms. Thurman and I saw it. It was in the 28 documents that uh, could not uh, be released. This one not because of executive privilege, but because they were under the privy of the, uh, of Mr., um, the independent counsel, Mr. Starr. And then we did see it, and what it simply said is that Mr. Foster was forwarding Linda Thompson, the militia leader's tape on Waco, to Mr. Noble and the Attorney General. Nothing nefarious, nothing that had anything to do with anything, and I don't think we should leave that hanging. As for this letter from the De Texas Department of Public Safety, again, it was acknowledged by the Texas Rangers. They asked Ann Richards who they should call because they were having trouble with the FBI. Ann Richards mentioned a name. And that has nothing, that is not dispositive of anything. She, may have, she mentioned Vince Foster's name. We don't know why she did. She had nothing to do with the investigation. I would hope that we wouldn't call Ann Richards in now and ask her why she mentioned that name, continuing in this fishing expedition type of mode. Well, and I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Thank you. And if we do call Ann Richards, I hope we can also get the reporters from the Waco newspaper that my colleague from Mississippi has asked uh, repeatedly to, uh, to hear. Uh, Attorney General, some have suggested that um, the use of tear gas be suspended. Uh, in America by police forces and I've heard from a local uh, police who fear that that would leave them only with lethal weapons not non-lethal weapons. Do you have a view on that? I certainly do. I mean if we just look at America in these last two weeks uh, tear gas has been a means of resolving a situation that could otherwise be terribly dangerous to life and limb. From what I understand in the review of police agencies around the country Many have had to use it. It is an alternative to lethal force. And what we all must do is continue to look as the Department of Justice is pursuing what we can develop. I mean, if we can send a man to the moon, we ought to be able to develop non-lethal technologies that help us review this. I keep thinking of waking up in the middle of the night and thinking there must be some substance that we could fly over, put them to sleep for an hour, and go in and get them. Thank you. I uh, did get an answer, and I know you uh, indicated earlier, and I absolutely believe that you were not watching the clock in terms of money uh, at the time that you were making your decision based on what was the prudent law enforcement uh, course to make. But I recall at the time, I was not a member of Congress. I was living off in a town in California, and uh, a lot of people were watching it, wondering how much was it costing to do that siege. And uh, as I understand it, it was about $5.9 million for the siege projected out for a year. My figures are right. It, that would be about $47 million for a year if we kept the force up. Um, and I'm just sort of wondering, is there a policy? I and mean, $47 million would probably save 20 kids from some other uh, death or disorder in the country. How do you assess resources in the future, especially given the uh, budget cutting that is going on, uh, you know, in this Congress? How do you balance the need uh, to do a law enforcement job with the reality that your budget is being cut and resources need to be uh, sorted in the way that will do the most good for the most people? Those are the most difficult financial issues that we have to face, but it, at that point I had not address that. I just didn't think that money should be part of the equation as no, we try no, to... No, and I acknowledge that, but I'm, since we're looking in an oversight capacity about what do we do in the future, and I note that uh, there's an AP report that uh, last year a group of um, Branch Davidians uh, uh, had an incident out west of not the same as this, but it could have grown to that. In the future, how are you going to cope with the fiscal realities and the budget cuts and the need to apply resources in the most prudent way, especially given your record 
on early intervention and prevention of crime with young people, which yeah. has the greatest potential for making our country safe. I think what, what we need to do is to make sure that our efforts are as effective as possible to address the concerns that Chairman Hyde raised to make sure that negotiators and tactical people have the best information possible, have that exposure to the best experts so that we try to bring these matters of this type to solution as early as possible. As you well know, I'm a strong proponent of prevention. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Lofgren. Your time has expired. Mr. Zeloff, you're recognized for five minutes. General uh, Reno, uh, I, I sure hope in no way that my former questioning had anything to do with the embarrassment situation that, that was referred to. Mr. Chairman, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, I don't know you nearly as well as I know Chairman McCollum. Okay. But I, 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 just, I just would... You I, have not... I, I certainly would like you to respect not, you and your position in any, every way possible. You have not in any way embarrassed thank me, you. sir. Thank um, you. I, I would like to thank you quickly on Oklahoma City. I think it was an outstanding uh, example of, of uh, success for the U.S. government, led by our president, uh, the FBI, uh, DOD, uh, F ATF, FEMA, every organization in this government responded with perfection. And at the time, I, 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 I spoke out in New Hampshire what a great job the President did. And I think he deserved that credit for coordinating that response, as you and all the law enforcement people and everybody else did. And I, I, think, I think that's uh, outstanding. I'd like to pass out a copy of the White House document that's been referred to earlier from Judge Mikva. July 31st, 1995, second paragraph, first two sentences. The facts relating to the President's involvement in the decision to end the siege at Waco are a matter of public record. The President has never shied away from, indeed has repeatedly acknowledged his knowledge and ultimate approval of the decision. And, and again, I don't want to keep... I, yes, sir. I thought this was the same we're, letter that Mr. Passing. Paul objected to earlier. Okay. Um, I, if this could be... Uh, Distributed if nobody has it, we'd be glad. We're in the process of distributing it right now. I thought Mr. Bayh had already objected to the letter being a part of the record, though. Well, is this on my time, or I hope not? I'm just making a parliamentary inquiry. No, I, I thought uh, I, we were... I don't believe uh, the regular order is being called for. I, it is Mr. Zellow's time. I do not know if this document was the one uh, or not, but we'll determine that in a minute. Well, you may I proceed. Object if, if, well, if, I, I think... I think well, he hasn't asked to admit it yet into evidence. Okay. So well, I, I would like. I am. I am submitting. We are discussing it. It has been talked about on several occasions on both sides of the aisle. It was received yesterday. It involves, and all I'm trying to do is establish a chain of command. Who was in the loop? I think it is important. I, I share it with anybody who'd like to have it shared with them. Um, it, it is, and I, and I appreciate the acknowledgement from the judge that. that I mean, are you asking the United States to admit this document as evidence? Yes, I am. Uh, is there objection? Hearing none, it is so admitted. You have an additional minute on your time. Okay. And, and I guess uh, my, my, uh, my problem with, with all this, I'm just a, a, a small businessman from New Hampshire who now is a member of Congress. And when something happens in my business, uh, I have to be responsible for it. I can't blame it on the maintenance man. I can't blame it on any, other, any number of people. And so my problem with government generally is accountability and responsibility. It's what I ran on. And what I, I have, a, uh, and I have no problem with, if we make mistakes, we just need to, to uh, address it. As I'm trying to explain the oversight role that I have, the responsibility that I have here, um, as I see it, and, and the accountability and the responsibility, as we try to explain to the American people exactly what took place at Waco, I think one chapter of that is what is the chain of command and who is in the loop. And I've said on Sunday, um, and, and I, I just would like to, to kind of explain when I said that we killed 80 over 80 people, what I really said, Koresh was the bomb. We lit the fuse. Now, we could talk about whether that's right or whether that's not right, but maybe you can comment on that. But what... What I'm trying to get to in my own way is how do I go back to a town meeting in New Hampshire and explain after 10 days exactly what happened and do it in a concise way, who was involved in the decision, what went wrong, what went wrong with ATF, what went wrong with FBI. Um, right now, people say, well, why do we have these hearings? And what they really saw was is they, they saw Mr. Potts get promoted and they saw two other 
folks from ATF get fired and rehired. Even in this hearing, we were not able to bring out the substantial information as to why they got rehired. Um, and, and it just seems like it's awfully hard. Uh, we have a Treasury document and we have a Justice document. And a lot of people say, well, you know, what's wrong with just analyzing your own department and putting out your own report? Why do we need oversight? And so uh, what, what I'm really trying to do is have we really gone through the process adequately and to the fullest extent possible in terms of identifying who is in the loop and, and I think based on this last statement, the President was in the loop. Judge Mickford said that. That's great. Uh, you, when you go to him and ask for, for approval, and I assume you did that on the gas plan, or did you just tell him about it in, a, in applied approval? I mean, you, just, you might just mention in, in the corporate world, in the private sector, you would be asking for approval, and he would give it. And again, we'd stand by those decisions. Um, I guess. What I worry about is as we go forward with our report, do you feel that all the people that were responsible for everything that happened at Waco, uh, we, have we gone to the American people, are we, have we told them everything that's going to happen, or what about the next areas of accountability? We'll, we'll, we're going to probably deal with the two folks at ATF that got fired and rehired. Uh, you're dealing with Mr. Potts. Is there any other major areas here that we can add to the fact that we had this tragic situation, we've learned a lot from it, we need now to, to, to go forward and fix it so it, it, it doesn't ever happen again? And you've, you've indicated some things in, in your area. Is there anything else that you'd like to include? And particularly I, I, in the chain of command and, the, and, the, and who's involved in the, in the loop? I would just like to address one thing without and, and I mean to be supportive of you, sir, not critical. But there, As is, I am with you. there is an impression, and I don't, everything that I've heard about what you say, you're very supportive of law enforcement. You understand the pressures of people on the street. But when you tell me, because I, if, if you're correct, I lit a fuse that killed... No, I didn't, I didn't accuse you of doing that. I said we. Okay. I used the word W-E, we. As a government, it, I, I didn't it see has you. been characterized, and I think that's the reason it's so important that that we are careful. I join with you in in just saying. Well, did you really think that I meant you? I really did, sir, okay. and it well, hurts. I, I, I'm talking about the picture. I'm talking about a picture of a tank going into somebody's home, coming out, and an announcement saying, "This is not an attack." And, and I, I, I'm not. I, blaming, underst I understand, but. You've heard the process by which I, I went have. through, and you can't, I, I, I don't think you believe that I was callous enough to set a, a, a fuse. I, don't, I, don't, I think you did and what so, you thought was right. So it, it is important that we, how we phrase things. With res, let me see if I can give you a situation. If there was a congressman who was under investigation, and the President of the United States was involved in that investigation, that should not be. If there was a public official involved, the subject of an investigation, and a congressman called me and said, I want you to get that so-and-so, and he's, that would be wrong. The Justice Department and the prosecutor and law enforcement have a special role that is to some extent different from the military. The president is the commander in chief, but in law enforcement, it's characterized by some as quasi-judicial, quasi-executive. It is it requires some independence. What the president did, for example, in Oklahoma City, I think was a classic example. He went, he spoke out, he ensured that, that this nation responded in terms of State Department issues and coordination. But he didn't ask me about the details of the investigation until we had proceeded to the point where I could tell him as I was making the announcement. And it is so important that those processes be independent. That's the reason I think you can, and I feel presumptuous, and, but you ask, that you can tell your town meeting that the President of the United States let law enforcement do its job, ask to be kept advised in an appropriate way, and, and did his job the right way. I can't respond for ATF. That they will do. 
but let me just take it with the FBI because people have said, well, nobody was disciplined. Mr. Chairman, I have been over and over and over this case trying to find out anything that anybody did wrong. We, I don't know if anybody would ever have been right, but I didn't find what I perceived to be any negligence. I didn't find any misconduct. I didn't find any basis for disciplining somebody. I can assure you that the anguish of those deaths will be with us all. Well, obstruction of Mr. justice Mr. in some Zell, cases your time and rearranging the crime scene, you don't think anything was done Mr. wrong? Mr. Zeloff, your time well, has time expired. expired. Yeah, it has. Mr. Bryant, you're recognized for five minutes. I can find the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I get into my line of questioning, uh, uh, Ms. Collins on the other side, I think, had referred to Mr. Souter in an earlier statement she made this morning. Mr. Souter has had to go back to his hearing and has asked that I ask a unanimous consent that we attach a, a column uh, apparently in response to this uh, article she cited. And at that point, at this point, I would ask uh, unanimous consent and we just attach this column to the record. Without objection, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Reno, let me follow up on, on Mr. Barr's questioning regarding the uh, response from the uh, Texas Ranger who testified last week, I believe. And as I reviewed this letter and, and think about, try to recall his testimony, I do remember that it was early on. Uh, I had a different recollection, but now I remember it was early on after the initial ATF raid, as I recall, that he went to see the governor. And as I read this letter from the uh, uh, Mr. Cook, that it was uh, at that meeting with the governor that she gave him the name of Mr. Foster and Mr. Foster's telephone number that if he had any further problems with the FBI that he should call Mr. Foster directly at the White House, that that was the White House contact. Now, again, I guess we could surmise one of two things. Either that was her personal contact at the White House and she just gave him the number, or the second thing we could surmise would be that he was, in fact, handling the Waco uh, and that uh, he had told her to call about any questions with Waco. I, I don't know that we'll ever know that answer, but it gets around uh, to this issue of of uh, a belief that I have that the White House had a role in this uh, in terms of uh, Mr. Hubble uh, on your end and uh, his colleagues from Arkansas who included Mr. Foster and Mr. McClarty and Mr. Lindsay who were close advisors to the President at that time. Putting this into the political context of those days and not just focusing strictly on, on Waco as we have these 10 days. But let me get back to, to your trip to Maryland that day. As I understand uh, you, you retained uh, authority to terminate that, uh, that, and I have the wrong word, but I, I call it raid or whatever. You, you retained the authority to, to cancel that, and by that, is that true? Cancel you, what, sir? Did you retain authority to terminate that raid at any point? I don't know what the FBI would have done if I had terminated it while the lives of FBI agents or others were at risk and they had to do something. Okay, but at that point on the 19th now, we've got basically the only people whose lives were at risk would be inside those uh, armored personnel carriers, and to the extent they were, I understand that, but they could have certainly backed those out of, the, out of there and turned around and gone back, I assume. But, but by retaining that authority, and I think your answer was yes, you do. You don't know what the FBI would have done. I assume they would have obeyed you. Were you in close communication as you went to Maryland and as you attended your function up there and as you came back? Yes. Uh, were you aware that, in fact, the, they had demolished at least one half of that gymnasium and, in I, fact, accelerated I, the plan? I did not see the, the gymnasium. I saw them go to the front door to the side, but I didn't see the back. I still have some difficulty understanding how, the, from the FBI side, they could believe that this gas would be effective if, if you keep knocking holes in the building and, and letting that 35 mile per hour wind continue to come in there, and especially when you knock down half a gym and open it up, I, I don't know how you could ever imagine that would be effective. It seems to me you've got to go in and systematically begin tearing down the building, which it appeared to me they were doing. As I understand it, uh, and even understand, first of all, I'd like to go back to your original point, uh, because it's very difficult when people drop something and then move on to another point, so let me pursue it as as to the points that you raised. Uh, the acting Attorney General of the United States was an appointee of the Republican administration, Stuart Gerson. I met with him prior to the time I took office. 
uh, on general matters and to effect an appropriate transition when I was sworn in on March 12th. I think if you talk to Mr. Gerson, he will tell you that the President of the United States acted very appropriately in that situation. But the Governor of Texas may not have known that he was the Acting Attorney General or who the Ranger should contact. And it may well have been that she simply gave him Mr. Foster's name so that Mr. Foster could advise him as to who the Attorney General was, who he might contact, or what the circumstances were. But it was a very unusual situation because you were into an administration by some um, a month and a half without an attorney general. With respect to the trip to Maryland, the FBI urged that I go ahead and make the trip because they wanted, to, they considered that it was going to be a slow, gradual process. They did not expect that everyone would come out. They were worried that if I were publicized as canceling something, that it would attract attention and create additional pressures. I went because of that, but I was in constant communication with them. You answer my questions. Thank you. My Mr. time Bryant, is up. Your time is up. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, could I also make uh, ask by unanimous consent that we attach this uh, this uh, uh, Texas Ranger letter? I think we did, but without objection, uh, it will be if it wasn't. Mr. Schiff, you're Thank recognized. You. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Attorney General. Um, who was in charge of perimeter security around the Waco site the compound? What agency, I mean? The FBI. All right. Did the FBI ever ask for help from Texas authorities to help bolster perimeter security? I don't know what specific understandings existed between the FBI and Texas authorities. What I did in terms of uh, perimeter security, when I asked, when they expressed concern about the HRT, state of readiness because it had been online for 51 days, I asked first, can't you pull them back and send another no, it's in? Not, it's not the hostage rescue team, it's perimeter security against this militia army that's marching on the Waco compound that you referred to. I don't know of any militia army that was marching on the Waco compound, sir. I've explained to you what the information was. Well, did, did, he, did, did, did here, the here FBI... Here is the let important... Me, let, me, let, me, let me state the question. Did the FBI request help with per, perimeter security from Texas law enforcement? I believe that's a yes or no question. Sir, my understanding is that they did and that the Texas law enforcement authorities were involved. But to go to the further point, with respect to perimeter security, what I was told was that the HRT would have to be pulled back. I asked if we couldn't substitute local law enforcement or state law enforcement capacity to control the perimeter. I was advised by the FBI that they did not have the capacity of an HRT team. To patrol? That relates to the perimeter security. Perimeter security, as I understand it, and you will have to check with the FBI or I can get the details for you, the FBI had local law enforcement involved in part of it, but to retain the capacity for sharpshooting, for the capacity to control it, you needed a team of the quality and the skills of the HRT. To, to patrol a perimeter, to keep outsiders from coming in? Not just to patrol the perimeter, but to ensure the perimeter security. Well, from the outside, because you referred to perimeter security from the outside, you brought up the issue of the militias, and I'm wondering if... From the you... outside and from the inside, sir. Right. People did come out of the, way of, of the compound between February 28th and March 21st. Is, is that right? That's right, sir. And I presume that they were checked for weapons or explosives when they came out. There'd be some standing procedure for that? I don't know exactly what the procedure was. I am, assume that they were... What, what was done with those people? It would depend on the... I would distinguish between the children. I don't know what the... As, as I understand it, the children were checked. In terms of health, they were returned to their families where appropriate. Others were charged where there was evidence that they were involved in the original uh, assault on the... ATF agents, but I don't have the specifics with me. Were all the adults who came out of the compound charged? Do you know? I don't know, sir. 
If they were, wouldn't that make people reluctant to come out of the compound who you wished to surrender and, and avoid a confrontation with? I think that's one of the issues that we had to face. You had people in the compound who we believed were responsible for the death and the entry of ATF witnesses, and we could let them come out and let them walk away from it, but I couldn't in good conscience let that happen where I had evidence that anyone was liable. Well, just uh, since my time is about up, I would like to go back to the CS gas question, and, and just to this extent. Um, there was no, I appreciate the fact that you tried to look at the uh, effects of this gas, but there was no example anyone gave you of where there had been a deliberate or even accidental, uh, but certainly not a deliberate gassing of children to find out what the effects would be. Because when I asked the experts, they couldn't give an example. So that no example existed that fit this situation. Yes, sir, that's what you said this morning, and I agreed yes, that I know of no situation that fit this situation. And uh, Mr. Jamar stated rather dramatically that he would be willing to wait a year in uh, earlier testimony, uh, if he had assurance that Mr. Koresh would come out. I would agree. You would, agree, you would have waited for a year? If I'd known he was coming out for sure at the end of that year. Well, what about perimeter security, child abuse, child sexual assault, and all the other reasons you've said were the need to make a decision to go forward? One, one of the factors was whether the negotiations, the continued negotiations, would produce a situation in which he would come out. He had lied from the very beginning. We've been over that today. And based on everything that was told to me, the negotiations had reached an impasse in terms of trying to get anybody to come out. If I could have been assured that at the end of a year, he would come out after he'd written his seven seals, I would have waited, as I indicated earlier to Chairman Hyde, I would wait if I had some assurance that he was coming out. But just to follow up, waiting would have meant all this perimeter problems, the fatigue of the hostage rescue team, the child abuse would have continued for a year. It, it sounds like that statement you've just made, with respect, Madam Attorney General, contradicts the reasons you've said for... No, it forward. doesn't, sir. You're Mr. simply... Schiff, your, time, your, your time is up. You're Let, simplifying uh, the whole right. matter. What well, I tried to stress from the very beginning is that so many factors went into this. You've got to weigh one against the other. If I had no feeling that he was going to come out at the end of the year, if I knew that he was going to come out at the end of the year and that he had not in that interim period done it, that he would not do anything to take his life or the life of agents, I would be in a totally different Mr. situation. Mr. Schiff, your time is up. Uh, Mr. Blute, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks again, uh, Attorney General Reno, for your straightforward answering here. I agree with you that this format is difficult uh, to maintain some focus on a line of questioning. And in order to do that, I would now yield my five minutes to Chairman McCollum. Thank you very much, Mr. Blute. Uh, testimony, Ms. Reno, we received uh, indicates that one of the Army officers with whom you, you consulted on the use of the CS gas told you that there were risks with that gas and that mothers might leave their children when that gas was used. Knowing this, wasn't it clear that the chances of success of the heart of this go-slow gas plan, that is, getting the mothers to come out with their children, was improbable? I don't remember that, and the officer who testified, as I understand it, was not at the meeting. He was testifying from notes. What I was concerned about is that a mother might be in one place, she might come out and leave the child in, at any rate, the separation. And these were, again, what we were told was that the gas would be far more effective than it was. Its effectiveness was apparently diminished because of the wind, but that they would not be able to remain inside and that the people would come out. Let me assure you that though Ambassador Holmes did the testifying yesterday because of classified information of the identities of these officers, uh, I was present, as with all of the uh, subcommittee members, when we got a briefing with those officers present, and that was the, the testimony of one of the officers. Now, I'm not questioning uh, anything else. I'm I just want you to be aware. What my memory is. No, no, I this, understand. The I'm same not... situation would arise if the parent got separated. Let me ask another question about the follow-up on something that I still haven't been completely satisfied on. I got you detoured early on when I asked the last set, and I didn't really get around to following up. After you had uh, indicated to me a few minutes ago 
uh, when I was questioning you last that uh, if you were, that, that you were pretty sure that the shooting would occur on those vehicles as they approached the compound, that that was a logical thing. I think that I'm paraphrasing what you, you responded to me. Uh, would you have not logically concluded once that thought was there in your mind uh, that the gas plan would inevitably be accelerated or more probably than not be accelerated and that given all that was known about the Davidians uh, it, it would not have been sensible uh, it would not have been logical to expect that the Davidian mothers would react by bringing their children out when you had this accelerated assault when you had the, the, the involvement that Mr. Clark, the, the, the Deputy Director of the FBI, said he was so concerned about. In other words, I'm concerned that whether you made this step or not in your reasoning at that moment under all the pressure and all the facts that were before you, I don't know. But looking at it in the cold, hard light of day, it seems logical that if you expected the, the vehicles to be fired upon and you knew the plan said when they were that the accelerated gas insertion program would take place and I assume you knew what Mr. Clark uh, told us and that is that that he could, he was always concerned that the accelerated gas program if it actually happened that way would result in in the opposite reaction from what we wanted that they would they would indeed retreat or act some other way um, act more like Davidians I guess you could say than, than rational people wasn't that of grave concern to you did you think about that Mr. Chairman, if I haven't convinced you by now that I tried to think of everything, that I was concerned about everything, and that I reached the best conclusion that I could, I'll try again. <laughs> My whole point was, what do we do? I have no assurance that they're coming out. Chairman Hyde and others have talked about their messianic complex and what they might do at any time. You've dismissed that as saying, well, that was just March 2nd, but it's replete throughout there. I was taking the best situation I had, taking the best step that I could to try to get them out. The factor that is more important to me than anything else is based on what I was told by everybody responsible. It was that the gas would have a far more immediate impact than it did. And as I've indicated earlier, I think that was because of the wind. But there was the additional concern. It was not just the insertion of the gas throughout the building. It was another feature which related to the egress and to the concern that all of us had that they'd be able to get out if somebody was trying to block it. Those were the factors that went into this consideration. Well, the, the point is that it's obvious that you felt the risk was worth it. And I'm not trying to put any words in your mouth. That's just the conclusion I think that you've given us. And I don't doubt it. I'm just trying to bring out the facts. Got a question very quickly for you. Did you know, did anybody inform you, either Mr. Sage, I guess he didn't do it directly, or Mr. Hubble, or somebody who, who was your go-between to talk to the commanders at the field uh, about the negotiations, did you know that Mr. DeGarren, the attorney for Koresh, had earnestly expressed to the negotiators, to Mr. Sage in particular, that he believed not only in this last minute plan, but that he believed that Korish would come out within 10 days or so of the 14th or 15th, I guess the 14th of April. Did that, I, I'm just asking where that ever got conveyed to you, that particular 10-day point, not whether it would have made any difference or not, but whether it got conveyed. It was not conveyed as, as an agreement. It was conveyed as, as DeGuerin no. thinking that he was going to come out and after he finished the seals that it would be anywhere okay. and the uh, there were different days discussed. That is what prompted the effort to find out specifically when he was coming out since he had again and again said he was coming March 2nd, March 19th for the Passover and he wouldn't come out. That's the reason we followed up and tried to see what Dr. Meyer well, well, no, thought of it. I understand. That's the point though is whether or not you were told specifically what DeGarren told us here and that is that he advised Mr. Sage and the negotiating team that on the 14th that he really believed that DeGarren would come out within about 10 days. That Koresh, that he could, would Koresh, I mean, that Koresh would come out within about 10 days that he would have completed these seals in that short a period of time. Now, I'm not asking whether you'd believe it, whether the, obviously the FBI didn't believe it. I, I really want to know if that particular 
strikingly, relatively, comparatively short time point was even given it, to you as a piece of information. This, That's all. this was so important because it came immediately, the letter to DeGaron, immediately after uh, the letter of April the 14th, was a part of all of our conversation. I looked at the letter, I analyzed the letter, I said, what do we have to show that it's for real? And the 10 days was in that letter? I don't, I don't know whether it, it was there. in the letter, and I don't know whether it was specifically 10 days or not. But well, that's what I, I understand. That's why I was getting it. I just wanted to know, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but 10 day, the 10-day point is important to me, and it's not necessarily decisive of anything, but I would like to have known that you was, answered it. You don't know. And I you think don't it remember was it. very important in terms of DeGaron and the letter to see whether there was any step that he was taking that was going to show what happened and we tried to respond to that. By the way, our records don't show that Schneider ever say, said six months or six years. That may be something you had conveyed to you, but our copies of the transcript don't show that for what it's worth department. Not that that again is material necessarily. We're going to take a recess. My time has expired until five minutes uh, after the conclusion of this vote. We'll be back after that. Well, I think there's just one vote going on right now, but if there's more than one, it'll be five minutes at the conclusion of the final vote of this series. Thank you. We're in recess. Joint House Subcommittee hearing on the Waco investigation will continue in just a moment. First, some program information. Later this morning on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, the newspaper roundtable guests will be Congressman Bill McCollum of Florida and Robert Scott of Virginia. C-SPAN's Washington Journal...